Hello everyone. Today, I'm going to be talking about George Harrison. As you can see, I'm in my own version of his Concert for Bangladesh look, but because it's super hot here right now, I haven't grown the full beard and instead settled on his trademark moustache. So this is a video that I've been looking forward to making for a while. After ranking all of Paul McCartney and John Lennon's solo albums in 2021 and 22 respectively, I knew George Harrison would obviously be next. And George is in a rather unique position, as unlike Lennon and McCartney, who up until 1970 were in a songwriting partnership, George Harrison had always written his own songs. So his solo discography is really just an extension of what he was building towards in the Beatles. And of the three key songwriters in the Beatles, George Harrison's solo career, I often feel is overlooked compared to that of Lennon or McCartney. John Lennon's tragic death lionized the man and his limited number of albums are held up in celebration of his tremendous legacy. Paul McCartney, now in his 80s, is still making albums and playing three hour live shows, leaving no doubt about his living legend status. But George Harrison, the least outspoken and least flashy of the ex-Beatles, had perhaps the most intriguing musical journey of all four of them. The man was always somewhat of a mystery, but he let us know who he was through his songs. And it's for this reason that this video is longer than either of the other two, because there is such a depth here that I really want to do justice to the astonishing life and music of George Harrison. Now, please don't misinterpret what I'm saying. Obviously, I believe John and Paul also carry tremendous depth and intrigue in their music, but the world has long acknowledged their luminary status. Heck, even Frank Sinatra called Harrison's Something the greatest Lennon and McCartney song until he was eventually corrected. Something in the way she moves. So I think it's finally time to give George his due. Plus 90% of you asked for a longer video, so here you go. In this video, I will be ranking from worst to best his 10 studio albums from his post Beatles career, followed by a brief discussion of his other musical projects, from the Traveling Wilburys to film soundtracks and live records. As with the other ex-Beatles, there's a debate as to what constitutes a studio album, and although people often include electronic sound in this studio catalogue, I will be touching on it after the call list. I also won't have time to talk about the many albums he produced, which I may include in a separate video because George Harrison does not get enough credit for his stellar talents as a producer, easily the most adept of the four Beatles. In preparation for this video, I've also been doing some reading, namely from his autobiography, I Me Mine, and also While My Guitar Gently Weeps, The Music of George Harrison by Simon Lang. And one final reminder before I begin that this is my list. I'm sure amongst my obvious picks will be a few upsets, so please keep in mind that you're watching one person's subjective opinion. Just really good to get that disclaimer in early. All right, folks, it's finally time. Let's get to the list. We begin our ranking with the gloomy soul snoozer, extra texture, brackets, read all about it. Okay, yes, this is at the bottom of my list, but I still own this record on vinyl because it does feature one of my favorite jokes from George's discography. First of all, there's a bit of extra texture on the physical record itself. It's like kind of bumpy. And on many releases was a die cut cover that reveals Oh, not him again. <laughs> this was gonna be the original name of the album. Basically, it's just a self-deprecating nod to Harrison's diminishing popularity by the mid 70s. And I don't know, I just think it's pretty funny. It's charming. So why isn't the rest of the album? Well, 1975 was not a fun year for George Harrison. After indulging in all kinds of hedonistic pursuits the year before, involving cocaine, bottles of brandy, and the odd bit of wife swapping, I'll get to that later, plus releasing an album and corresponding US tour that was ripped to shreds by top music publications like Rolling Stone, George was quite keen to rehabilitate his standing in the pop world. And who could blame him? The coverage of the Dark Horse tour was less a review and more repeated personal attacks of a concert that most attendees were otherwise enthralled by. If I learned anything from that, it would probably be never to go on tour again. So while in LA, working on his new Dark Horse label next to A&M Records, Harrison cut a bunch of songs that would also free him from his contract with EMI and Capital's Apple Records, which was on its last legs anyway. For nearly every other of George's albums, he used his own home studio in Friar Park and had no desire to record in LA, deeming the quality of the sound out of the music scene there subpar, but it was a matter of expediency and convenience. So it was within the seedy walls of A&M Studios that George Harrison made his worst post Beatles album filled with a smooth yet morose California soul sound. And this time his guitar was given a backseat for the many keyboards and dated 
synths that are all over this dismal record. Though you wouldn't think it depressing from the way the LP begins. Something I will say about George is that he always knew how to open an album. So many of his albums, even the average ones, begin with a cracking opening number and extra texture is no different. After battling intense laryngitis recording his Dark Horse album and tour, George Harrison was sounding better than ever on this galloping pop triumph of an opening number, You. Lyrically, it was his simplest song in years, finding itself in the same territory as early Beatles hits where the singer emphasized you and I pronouns to insert the listener into the song's narrative. You was actually written in 1970 for Ronnie Spector of the Ronettes. And you can really hear that Motown spirit in this with this double serving of drums and searing saxophone. Ronnie Spector obviously had a greater vocal range than George Harrison who hit some bloody high notes in this. He later admitted that it was pretty hard work getting there, but I've always quite liked George Harrison's high register. It doesn't have the power of John or Paul's, but George had a very sweet and delicate falsetto that I always found very pleasing to hear. It's a stellar track. McCartney had silly love songs, Lennon had Whatever Gets You Through the Night, and George Harrison had You. Three mid-70s up-tempo bangers that dip their toe into disco. It's so good, halfway through the album, it's brought back for another 45 second instrumental with the track A Bit More of You. However, after the merriment of you, things come to a grinding halt and sadly don't pick up for the rest of the album as we launch into a funeral march tempo on The Answers at the End. This is one of the handful of songs from George's discography that incorporates lyrics from quirky aphorisms carved into the walls all around his home, Friar Park, from its previous owner, Sir Frank Crisp. Throughout his life, when asked about his relationship to Paul McCartney, Harrison would respond with this crispy quote, scan not a friend with microscopic glass. You know his the rising chord progression in the chorus is classic Harrison, but the melody is just too meandering and slow for me, and at five and a half minutes, the damn song feels like it'll never end. I do like George's unexpected soul scatting in the closing bars, though. Hmm. Something that the US tour and his three prior albums had revealed to Harrison once and for all was that people simply didn't care about being God conscious or the glory of Krishna or getting liberated from birth and death. They just didn't want to know. And George was always someone who was enthusiastic and, and wanting to share these life-changing discoveries to the world. So for him, this was a major blow to his psyche. And as such, Extra Texture is the only George Harrison album that is devoid of any obvious theological declarations. George is merely asking for tolerance on this album. His confidence is shaken and there's a clear sign of defensiveness as exhibited on the song, This Guitar Can't Keep From Crying. A sequel to the Beatles epic, While My Guitar Gently Weeps. That song, it was really just that, it's a cheap excuse to play a bit of guitar. It's Son of Guitar Gently Weeps. This track is all about George defying his detractors, in this case Rolling Stone, as you can see from this none too subtle reference in the lyrics. The song also contains the lyrics, but I'm happier than I ever been. You could have fooled me, George. It's not too bad. The guitar work in the second half is pretty decent, but the dated ARP synthesizer is far too prominent in the mix of a song that's meant to emphasize George's guitar. Prior to this album, every single that George Harrison released charted no lower than 36 on the US Billboard Hot 100. But this guitar became the first single of his to miss it entirely. The first time that it happened to any former Beatle. But ultimately it didn't matter, as the song is nowhere as memorable or stirring as the original White Album track it's based off. George's grievances with his detractors doesn't end there as we turn to the lumbering and awkward world of stone. Which is so forgettable that even after repeated listens, I was still struggle to hum this to you. That's also another major issue I have with this album. You kind of can't whistle to any of the songs. On this track, George's voice is so low in the mix, it's hard to make him out. Plus, he sounds unconfident in verses, like he, he isn't sure he should even be singing. It's grim stuff, man. But the most downcast song on the whole album is the miserable Grey Cloudy Lies. Another example of one of George's favorite framing devices using weather to describe his state of mind. George really loved weather metaphors. This is a really bleak affair. George later said that he was in a real down place while making the album and you can feel it. Complete with worrying imagery of holding a pistol to his brain. I, there was no concealing how the man felt. George's regular bass player at the time, Klaus Vormann, left the sessions halfway through saying, quote, In LA, I was not happy about the way George was developing, and I think he felt embarrassed about that. When they do too much cocaine, people lose their reliability. 
it was not the old George. This meant that Harrison played his own bass parts on many of the songs, including a Moog and ARP synth bass on the track that coupled with the somber lyrics make for an almost inappropriate sonic palette. Also, I've mentioned this before, I realize it's technically pronounced Moog, but I feel like the common pronunciation is Moog, so I'm just gonna keep saying Moog. One of the more enjoyable elements of the album is George's attempt at incorporating some miracles-inspired soul into the songs. Like on the track, Ooh Baby, You Know That I Love You, a tribute to Smokey Robinson, the first of two in his career. I just realized that one of my favorite singers has been Smokey Robinson as a songwriter also. It's a sweet and sensual number where George keeps up a falsetto voice for much of the track, going full soul. But ultimately isn't able to dredge this tribute out from under the malaise that so afflicts extra texture. The soul music continues on Can't Stop Thinking About You. I can't stop thinking about you. You know, Paul McCartney was often the one criticised for overly sentimental lyrics and sappy songs, but George could pump them out just as easily, sometimes going even further into full melodrama as showcased by the melody and lyrics in this track. Speaking of Lennon and McCartney, the two of them never really demonstrated that much interest or proficiency at soul music, compared to Harrison who showed a real knack for it and experimented with a genre as much as he did folk in the early 70s, so props to him. Have you ever had one of those nights where you went out and you wish you did? Mm. George Harrison sure did, as he sings in one of the better cuts on the album, Tired of Midnight Blue. This is a fairly robust blues track with plenty of cowbell, hand claps, moody guitar riffs, and great piano work from Leon Russell. This song gives an insight into the seedy elements of the drug-fueled LA music scene that George was realizing he wanted no part in. It's fine, but I can't pretend I listen to it all that much. The album closes with an eye roll of a track titled His Name Is Legs, Ladies and Gentlemen. This this overly long bit of throwaway just feels like a joke I'm not in on. George even admitted it was for one or maybe two people. It's about a guy called Legs Larry Smith who played in the English comedy act the Bonzo Dog Duda Band. All the little pigs, they grunt and howl, the cats meow, the dogs bow wow. And sounds like he was just one of those quirky guys that had a court jester effect on George. It was the beginning of George's inclusion of Python-esque references in his music, which would develop over the coming years. The lyrics are already esoteric and nonsensical and because of the cluttered mix, you can't really make out what Harrison is even saying about him, nor discern much from the spoken word moments from Smith himself. An unfunny comedy track that's too little too late anyway after the listener has been put in the most dour of moods thanks to nearly every song prior to this closer. So that's Extra Texture, a lugubrious, arrhythmic record with mushy production that does not at all reflect the cheeky album artwork or vibrant title. Even George would go on to call this a grubby album years later. George Harrison was someone incapable of masking his emotions in his music, which was ultimately one of his greatest strengths as a songwriter and singer, but here you really worry for him. After this album though, he headed back to England with his new girlfriend, Olivia Arias, and thankfully the remainder of the 70s were a big improvement for both George and his music. But as for me, this album's only getting a measly five out of 10. Ugh. Okay, it's time to... It's time to loosen up a bit. The early 80s was a time that found many 60s and 70s rock stars in the musical wilderness. With new wave, post-punk and dance pop ringing through the airwaves, many fading stars couldn't seem to find their footing in this radically changing world. Now what's the matter buddy, ain't you heard of my school? Combine this with the oil crisis of the late 70s, bringing on a recession that rippled out to the music industry where label heads were anxious that their artists' music wouldn't be commercial enough to play on radio and so pressured musicians to focus on writing hits. This was the unfortunate place George Harrison found himself when putting songs together for his first album of the 1980s, Somewhere in England. After his sunny and upbeat self-titled LP from 1979, George continued his creative streak, returning to a theme in his music that he'd kept relatively concealed for the last six years, his spirituality. By October 1980, he'd compiled a lovely set of songs to present to head of Warner Brothers Records, Mo Austin. However, in a first for any ex-Beatle, Austin rejected the album on the grounds of it being too laid back, not modern enough, and lacking in commercial viability. And this is after George wrote and recorded a song dedicated to him. Austin even vetoed the terrific album artwork only to have it replaced with this generic shot. Thank God it's since been reinstated because this is one of the best album covers of George Harrison's career. To try and maximize profits as much as possible, Warner Brothers had been running focus groups and street polling to find out what constituted a hit single. 
coming to the conclusion that it was a song of love gained or lost between 14 to 20 year olds. In George Harrison's own words, he said, shit, what chance does that give me? George reluctantly acquiesced and agreed to replace four of the songs with more radio-friendly bops. This is actually kind of devastating because the songs that were removed were some of Harrison's strongest compositions of the 1980s. These include Flying Hour, a jaunty track about living in the present, Sat Singing, a touching and personal song about meditation, Lay His Head, a sweet and beguiling tune about finding solitude, and finally Tears of the World, a song condemning ecological devastation and big business that foreshadowed the calamity of climate change. The original album was to be released in November 1980, however George had no choice but to return to the studio where he enlisted the help of Ray Cooper to help produce some new tracks delaying the album to 1981. This whole situation saw George channel his frustrations into the opening track of the album Blood From A Clone, a musing on how every song needed to sound more or less the same for it to be a hit. George apes the sound of popular music with a ska beat, windy synths and some steel drum for good measure. The lyrics are incredibly specific and more or less a fuck you to Warner Brothers for making him do this in the first place, which I do respect. I do listen to this track, I think it's enjoyable enough, it just, it just gets the album off to a rather nihilistic start. If Blood From A Clone was going after the music business, then the next track, Unconsciousness Rules, goes straight for the very people who consume these same formulaic radio hits. Yeah, George was really in his curmudgeon era on this one. I mean, these lyrics are biting. You dance at the discotheque, that's why you look such a wreck, your face is pale, you look drawn, your clothes are dirty and torn. I do think that with all the partying of the 60s and 70s and all the benders that he's been on, it's a bit rich from George to condemn the new generation of young people people who are just trying to enjoy their Saturday Night Fever disco craze. You know all his lines about, I was never at a disco tech. Well, I wasn't. <laughs> to drag him out of them, you know? <laughs> the thing about this track, though, is that I'm just not absorbing George's bitter takes on young people because the song is just too damn catchy. <laughs> Like the band's putting in some really stellar work here. It's a bit of a throwback to the sounds of his 1976 album, which means it's not exactly fresh, but I like it. It's poppy and it's scathing, but without being a downer. Yeah, probably the best track of the revised 1981 editions. <laughs> Now the added twist of fate of Somewhere in England being delayed till 1981 is that John Lennon was murdered in December of 1980, which shone an unexpected spotlight on whatever singles George Harrison was to release the next year. This meant that Harrison reluctantly scored his highest charting single in years with All Those Years Ago, peaking at number two in the States and 13 in the UK. This also boosted album sales, even grazing the top 10 spots all around the world, two feats he hadn't accomplished since 1973. Before Lennon was killed, All Those Years Ago was a song that Harrison was going to give to Ringo Starr, but after laying down the drum track and vocals, Starr wasn't satisfied with it and the song was left unfinished. After Lennon's death, Harrison kept the drum track but wrote new words dead dedicated to John Lennon, which does mean that there's a certain dissonance between the simple, peppy, snap beat and the more solemn lyrics. Underneath it all is a moving tribute from George to John. Paul McCartney's tribute here today is a personal song between the songwriting pair, a conversation about what they meant to each other, and it's a real tearjerker. I love you. George's, on the other hand, is about what John Lennon actually brought to the world, why he mattered. But you point the way to the truth when you say, all you need is love. You are the one who imagined it all. Always looked up to you. George met Paul as a schoolyard equal, but he did always look up to John, and despite him being in George's words. John Lennon is a saint and he's heavy duty and he's great and I love him, but at the same time, he's such a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is your sure, But sure. that's the great thing about him, you see. You said it all, though not many had ears. You had control of our smiles and our tears. I mean, guys. Beautiful message. And you've even got Paul and Linda McCartney on backing vocals, plus Denny Lane from Wings, which makes it a rare release where three Beatles played on the one track. But perhaps because it's George and Paul, I can barely hear McCartney in the mix. Like, even Linda is coming through more clearly. A touching, if not fully realised, tribute. George's second and only other single from the album is the Elton John like teardrops that features a cheesy 80s infomercial sounding intro. Be the envy of all your friends with Summer in England by George Harrison. This is an otherwise enjoyable power pop packet with a decent hook and up tempo beat, exactly what Warner Brothers was hoping Harrison would produce. But because of that, plus the generic lyrics about a love lost, 
This can really only be described as a hack piece from George Harrison, perhaps the first of his career. A tune made out of obligation only, which makes it hard to enjoy authentically. Something else I notice about Teardrops is George's voice seems to have gone through a strange development. You can hear it in the verses here especially. He talks so sweet, but there's always much to say. He talks sweet, but... <laughs> What is that? It sounds like a bad Bob Dylan impression. Needless to say, Teardrops didn't become the hit it was designed to be, even with the glare of Lennon's death. The lesson being, let George Harrison make whatever music he friggin' wants to. We gave up sat singing for Teardrops? The guitarist also found himself going back to his early, early roots on this album with two covers by Hoagie Carmichael, one of his favorite artists. These are straight up skips for me. I find them so boring. Baltimore Oriole is just a snooze fest with Muzak like saxophone and a lugubrious tempo. And I'm sure if I had heard Carmichael's Hong Kong blues on the radio in the late forties, like Harrison did as a five-year-old. He got 20 years privilege taken away from him. This cover might be more endearing, but I just, can't get around this rather dull snippet of Harrison nostalgia. Something I can get around is Harrison's beautiful and personal ballad, Life Itself, featuring multiple clean guitar parts, plus his usual slide, blossoming backing vocals, and some tasteful Hammond organ. This song is actually a holdout from the other mystical tracks that were unfortunately cut from the album, but we're lucky we managed to keep this one, which has so much care and love in it. It's a love song to the higher power in George's life, who at different points he calls a lover, a friend, and a source of truth. It features a beautiful counter melody guitar solo that is a perfect example of what author Simon Lang describes as a song within the song. The song served as the artist's most overtly religious assertion since 1974. George really lets us inside his soul here. Perhaps becoming a parent helped give him the strength to write from this place again. This is George's spiritual vision set to music. This is what he's about, what he's always been about and it's a privilege to be invited into his inner world again. Elsewhere on the album, we have the song That Which I Have Lost, the last of the additional 1981 tracks. A curious song about George wanting to illuminate his consciousness with a country twang to it and features simple acoustic strumming, quirky synths and some unexpected tuba. Add in the clumsy lyrics, the tepid energy, and you've got a song that just doesn't quite coalesce for me. Similarly, the track Writings on the Wall is another spiritually adjacent number. It's George musing on one's own existence and features a welcome return of Indian instruments like the gub gubby, tabla, and gentle sitar drone. But even though it sounds pretty, the melody returns to that old meandering territory and the song just doesn't have a lot of staying power for me. George closes the album with his first song of ecological protest, which is a theme that he would return to 20 years later on his final record. Up to this point, George wasn't one to reference specific issues of the world in his music, with the exception of Bangladesh. But here he's fighting for the planet and its children's future, and I fully welcome this effort. However, unlike the stirring protest songs of the 60s, this composition is so jarringly quirky, you don't realize how important and prophetic the messages of this song are. Ah, it's where the influence of Monty Python really peaks for George Harrison, who had recently put up three million pounds to fund their film, Life of Brian. And he'd mortgaged his house to, to put up the money for this movie because he wanted to see it which is still the most anybody's ever paid for a cinema ticket. This protest song in question, called Save the World, features sound effects of bombs going off, cash registers, and general noisy machinery. <laughs> kind of reminds me of the Paul McCartney song, Average Person, which is probably not what you want when it comes to fighting against a nuclear arms race, wildlife devastation, and corporate greed. An admirable track, but baffling execution that I attribute to George's knack for using humor to offset otherwise depressing topics. Somewhere in England is a fairly bitter turn from Harrison's more recent efforts, but could you really blame him? He had quite a decent album ready to go, but even as an ex-Beatle was told it wasn't good enough and that he had to go make music for teenagers. This generated a mixed album featuring flashes of sincerity and beauty, tedious 1940s covers, catchy but resentful power pop packets, and ruminations on existence that are decent at best. Suffice it to say, George made no effort to promote the album and so retreated further into his own spiritual shell inside his gothic mansion becoming more at peace with his status as an out-of-touch rocker from yesteryear. That idealistic spirit of the 60s that lingered throughout the 70s had finally bitten the dust. Six out of ten.
After the painful back and forth process of releasing 1981's Summer in England, George Harrison had lost practically all interest in the music business. His real focus was elsewhere, namely helping to save the British film industry with his production and distribution company, Handmade Films. Its first release, Monty Python's Life of Brian, was a huge success, with George's efforts to rescue the film easily paying off. Handmade Films would go on to make a few more hits like With Nail and I in 1987, as well as a few flops, ultimately disintegrating around the early 90s. But back in 1982, Handmade Films was George Harrison's primary focus. Well, my role is I pop in and out, I hear what's happening day to day, I make any suggestions I can. And he was keen to properly liberate himself from the music business. George had one remaining album on his Warner Brothers record contract. He was essentially in the same situation as he was back in 1975 with the release of Extra Texture liberating him from Apple and EMI. His approach to recording them was going to be a casual affair with his mostly English mates for his own amusement. If people liked what he made, great, but that didn't matter to George anymore. Inspired by guitar virtuoso Ry Cooter's recent work with a talented trio of black doo-wop vocalists, Harrison enlisted these three fellas to come sing back up on the album. He also reused the production help of Ray Cooper, as well as former Beatles engineer Phil McDonald. The content of the new album would be inspired by Harrison's other passion of the early 1980s, going on holiday. Harrison was often seen both in Maui, Hawaii, and in northern parts of Australia, which opened him up to this breezy South Sea tropical sound, resulting in the 1982 release of the next album on our list, Gone Tropo. Man, this has got to be the worst album artwork for any of George's, for any ex Beatle even. Well, I say that like this monstrosity doesn't exist. Seriously though, I feel like I'm having an aneurysm every time I look at this. And you know who designed it? Legs Larry Smith, that freaking guy that George made that weird song about at the end of Extra Texture. Well, I guess he had the last laugh because yikes. Anyway, anyway, what do we have on here? Once again, opening the album with a bit of panache, the song Wake Up My Love zooms into our ears with that same cheesy 80s infamous commercial vibe as on teardrops, except this intro sounds more like if the news was a musical. <clears throat> Good evening and welcome to tonight's top stories. It's really not a bad track and the twin synth, slide guitar work and the chorus sounds contemporary and cool, plus the overall hook is pretty exciting. It's a bit more interesting than teardrops because the lyrics convey a desire for Harrison to find love, God's love in this case. Years earlier, Harrison learned that classical Indian music was written and performed with the express purpose of connecting with God. This was something that Harrison infused in his own music with early songs like My Sweet Lord and Awaiting On You All, and inspired this fun quote, music should be used for the perception of God, not jitterbugging. <laughs> But now a decade on from those early compositions, George is out here again asking for God's love, but this isn't the same God tenderly singing, give me love, give me peace on earth. This guy's more anxious and bitter towards the material world. He's run out of patience and he's yelling, well, you know me, he... can't give up now, let us make that clear. All I've had's the run around. His later use of the word Christ borders on an expletive instead of a yearning plea. Christ, I'm looking for some light. This very much speaks to George's relationship to his spirituality at the time. His belief and faith remained intact, but the last 10 years knocked him round a bit, having even less hope for humanity than ever before. This existentialist view of society is also reflected in the song That's The Way It Goes, one of the album highlights. To me, this is one of Harrison's most McCartney-esque compositions, featuring miniature fables of three men who all suffer from some sort of ego-driven illusion of the material 1980s. One obsessed with stocks and shares, one with buying up land in South Africa, and the third a fame-hungry actor. But where in earlier songs, Harrison may have sought to convert them to his spiritual vision by chanting the names of the Lord, he's now resigned to accept that this is the way the greedy world is now. That's the way it goes. That's the way it goes. This evolution in George's worldview makes this a fascinating song, but it's also one of the more musically engaging tracks on the album as well. The instrumental breaks are rich and inviting, made up of George's slide guitar. The track also features Willie Green, one of the three African-American backup singers. Green has an ultra bassy, deep harmony that I always find just a smidge unsettling. Feel his clouds, he can stoop so low. He uses this bass voice for the next track, a cover of the stereo's early 60s doo-wop song, I Really Love You. This song is bizarre. Musically, it's a pretty obvious recreation of the doo-wop style, but there's something a little off kilter about it. I don't know. 
Like if you didn't know this was a George song, you'd have no way of guessing it was his. He has instrumental tracks that are easier to recognize thanks to his slide guitar, which of course doesn't appear in this. He doesn't even sing the lead melody line. His voice is just one of the many in the backup harmony. Not an unpleasant song, just just an odd choice. We then get a laid back, more or less instrumental track on Grease. No, no, no. Like the country. Aside from the odd geographical wordplay like you go to Slavia, half past Armenia, this track is made up of mostly a series of twangy and bright guitars that offer a chilled out mood. A bit of filler, but a relaxed sunny time all the same. The warm coastal mood continues on the delightful album track. From the cheeky opening guitar passage to the riding off into the sunset finish, this is one of the better cuts off of Gone Troppo. George wrote this song while holidaying in Australia, which is where the expression comes from, to go mad from tropical heat. Mr. Speaker, he's going troppo. He's going troppo. <laughs> And there's a decent amount of zaniness on this track, let me tell you. The lyrics bring to mind tropical imagery like the high wide Morton Bay fig and eating a papaya. It's time you know I, got I just really enjoy the spirit of this song. It's, it's got some exotic instrumentation with George playing a series of Indian bowls called the Jal Tarang. Plus plenty of marimba and other Pacific percussive instruments. That was a mouthful. I can see a lot of people hating this song, but I find its corniness uh, somewhat irresistible. Counting the fruit back. It's all very silly, but at least stays authentic to the bonkers album artwork. Also, this is a silly album. It's pure goofa loofa. It has a fruity sound and dopey production. It's George Harrison's Pipes of Peace, which were only 11 months apart. So maybe George inspired Paul with some of the silliness, who knows? <laughs> The running theme in George Harrison's work is his insistence that he's not the person or the idea of the person that you think he once was, such as on earlier songs like The Light That Has Lighted the World. But where this used to be a plea for his own peace, he's now at the point where he accepts his bizarre status in the world as a living legend, which he explores in the charming song, Mystical One. This jaunty guitar track awash with mandolin sees George reflect on his life and surmise that he's happiest sitting by a stream, highlighting George's evergreen theme of his connection to nature. It's a great gratifying song, it even features a goofy vocoder effect in the chorus, but I kind of enjoy it, at least on this track. I highly recommend listening to the gorgeous acoustic demo of this track as well. It's completely different without all the bells and whistles, and it's more reminiscent of the songs from his 1970 output. Whilst coming up with songs to compile this new album and finish his contract, George got stuck thinking of ideas until his wife, Olivia, suggested he write one about their young child, Danny, which became Unknown Delight. With echoes of his Abbey Road hit Something, Unknown Delight is a beguiling song that sees George broach a new kind of personal muse, singing about his son and the darkest deep brown eyes I've ever seen. It's so genuinely beautiful and refreshing to hear George, the last of all the Beatles to become a dad, sing so openly about his child and how he freshens all around with all the love he brings. This is one of the songs I could have done without the other backup singers. <laughs> I usually love multi-part harmonies, but that, again, super bassy voice sounds a little intrusive on this very personal dedication from a father to a son. I think the production just overwhelms the sentiment. The production in general is my major complaint about this album. The choice of super clean, broad harmonies with obnoxious 80s synth and vocoder is just an uncomfortable fusion of sounds for me. I think there's a lot of beauty in many of these songs that gets undermined by this glossy exterior. Nowhere is this more invasive than on the nightmarish album album track, Baby Don't Run Away. It begins with this alarming opening vocal that sounds like it was designed to frighten children. Baby, don't run away from me. Unlike in Mystical One, the vocoder sits right alongside the deep and weird lead vocal from George and doesn't go away. The chord progression is absolutely wretched. Like, George, I know you like weird chords, but what are you doing here, man? The overblown Moog effects and the cringe vocoder is just clown car buffoonery. Then the verse quietens down before you hit with another <laughs> Ugh, it's excruciating. My least favorite George Harrison song. Thank God the next track is just pure basic pop fun with much more tolerable production. This may be because the song was actually written for the handmade film Time Bandits, where it played over the end credits. I haven't actually seen the film, but the song has that feel-good cheerfulness perfectly suited for the end of a fun family adventure film. George closes the album with an old Beatles throwback, 
Circles. This was a song Harrison wrote in Rishikesh, India in 1968 when the Beatles were under the tutelage of the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and was included in the Isha demos, a series of earlier takes that would eventually become the White Album. Back in 1968, George used a creepy harmonium to test out the track, friends go, friends go. which ultimately never moved past his living room until 1982 on Gone Tropo. This composition is a grower. At first listen, it's an ooky spooky oddity from George. Friends come and friends go, so I go round and round. Like, no song will kill a good vibe quicker, but if you're in the mood for it, this is a super intriguing offering from George. It's got an early 80s moodiness to it in the spirit of Joy Division, but the truth is this is a totally unique song. Revolving dissonant chords circle your ears as if to put you in a state of hypnosis. In circles. It's explicitly about reincarnation and features a quote from Lao Tzu that's very George. Who knows does not speak. He who speaks does not know. Gloomy as heck, but not a bad cut. Gone Tropo is somewhat of a contradictory album. It's George making sunny, jovial music for his own amusement, but it's also a record made begrudgingly to see out the end of a contract. This makes it hard to get wrapped up in the positive vibes of the album, knowing that much of this was a chore for Harrison. It's a shame the production synthetic glaze spoils much of the richness of the songwriting because there's plenty to enjoy on here, as well as moments that feel like I'm in a fever dream. Baby. Once again, Harrison had no interest in promoting the album, resulting in not even breaking into the US Billboard 100. A rare feat considering that every other of his solo albums made it into at least the top 20. George Harrison was seemingly done with making albums altogether. It would be another five years before he made another, his longest gap so far. It's quite close in quality to Summer in England, but I do think it's a tad better, so I'm going to give it a 6.5 out of 10. Whew, all this warm tropical chat has got me feeling pretty hot. In the head corner, the highway, modern day big gun trouble. In the years after Gone Tropo, George was content with his role as movie producer and gardener, with next to no musical contributions anywhere. And what's your ambition for Handmade now? Handmade? Uh, I don't have many ambitions at all. Not for Handmade, not for anything really. I think ambition is something you have to try and get rid of. He'd lend the occasional guitar part to some other artist's record, or the odd song for a film soundtrack, but it was mostly a quiet period for the guitar maestro. His main musical appearances were where he could surround himself with other musicians, such as on the incredible Carl Perkins HBO Rockabilly concert, where people like Harrison, Clapton, Dave Edmonds, Ringo Starr, and more gathered together to play some classic Carl Perkins hits in celebration of his song Blue Sway Shoes turning 30. It's an amazing concert and features the happiest George Harrison has ever looked on stage. He's playing guitar alongside his childhood hero and it's so genuinely heartwarming to see George connect back to the music that first turned him onto guitar and rock and roll. As the mid 80s became the late 80s, the has-been status attributed to the rock stars of the 50s and 60s was shifting into something grander. The 30-year cycle of pop culture was heading towards its first closed loop, as the classic rock sound was rising in popularity and these middle-aged men were now being viewed as legends. Around this time, George appeared at a couple of concerts, one in Birmingham and the other for the Prince's Trust. Both gigs featured ELO's Jeff Lynne, whom George Harrison had become friends with over the 80s, even going on holiday to Australia together. Cute. These recent casual gigs with friends show George that making music could be fun again, and so enlisted Jeff Lynne's help to co-produce his first album in five years, and the next on our list, the highly successful Cloud9. Now I know what you're thinking, isn't Cloud9 a little low on the list? Sure, to many this is an obvious top two or three spot, and I still think it's good. It's a fine album, but you need to understand that I didn't grow up with this record. Cloud9 was George Harrison's comeback smash. He did tons of promotion for it, music videos, interviews. Oh back. yeah, my new album's much better than anything the Beatles ever did. <laughs> Plus for Gen X's who were young and perhaps discovering the Beatles for the first time, this was the album by an ex beatle that they could enjoy alongside their parents on their newly minted CD player. Basically, this is a beloved LP by many. But just keep in mind that you're watching a review from someone who listened to it for the first time very much as an adult. Please don't come for me. Let's just dive in. From the opening bars of the title track, 
we are hearing a George Harrison who's finally acquiesced to the accessible music of the day. If we didn't have George Harrison's slide guitar and his voice, this could be a Tom Petty or Peter Gabriel track. The snare and bass drum is fashionably prominent in the mix and there's a bright metallic sound to the guitars. Harrison's voice is deeper and more rugged than before. Have my love. And the lyrics are uncharacteristically cryptic in a way that only makes this bluesy song less and not more compelling for me. Combine this with the heavy production from Jeff Lynne and I find this track all but eliminates Harrison's personality, save for some skillful guitar interplay between him and Eric Clapton, who offers up his talents on a number of tracks here. I know people dig this song, but for me, sorry, it's just a little too generic. This is followed up with That's What It Takes, a slightly more interesting song with plenty of George's famous odd chord progressions in the pre-chorus. It features a lovely slide guitar solo with, again, a metallic quality to the production. I don't know how else to describe it. We've got some 80s reverb and clean harmonies, clearly with Jeff Lynne on backing vocals, which I'm sure never stopped being a thrill for him. Yeah, the song is okay. It's sweet and everything, but I'm not on cloud nine just yet. The third track, Fish on the Sand, is finally where the album starts to capture my attention. It's got a terrific opening guitar riff that's very Beatles. In fact, this entire number chugs along with an early 60s rock energy that I love. The harmonies are on point and the yearning in George's voice is very potent. The, the catchiness of the song though is deceptive as the lyrics spell out some serious self-doubt in Harrison's faith. In classic Harrison fashion, this pseudo love song conveys an ambiguity where it could be about a woman, but a keen listener of Harrison's music would know that this is God swimming by his teardrops. And by comparing this absence of faith to feeling like a fish on the sand is admittedly very funny imagery. I'm not so much of a man, but like a fish on the sand. Which also gives this track a terrific balance of humor and pathos. Like, this could be my favorite track off of Cloud9. Oh, and there's also a really excellent cover of the song by the band A La La's, who lean into a more 60s psych sound. Really good stuff. Harrison also has a number of slower ballads on this album, beginning with Just For Today, a song George wrote after reading a pamphlet from one of his many friends battling addiction, namely alcohol. So they're not allowed to drink, you see. I can drink large quantities of wine and things because I'm not an alcoholic. But they gave me this little thing and it's a brochure from AA it says, um, just for today, you know, try to, don't worry about everything, just deal with one thing at a time, basically. So I thought, well, that sounds nice, and I just wrote that tune about it. This song can also be viewed as a tribute to all those that Harrison had lost to addiction and a balm for those still in the throes of it. The track features some truly gorgeous guitar solos and also a low hum of backing vocals, giving it a liturgical quality. If just for... Another of these slower compositions is the inviting Someplace Else. This is a reworked song from the handmade film Shanghai Surprise starring Sean Penn and Madonna that sounds like it was a disaster to make and watch. Do you want the truth? It was a pain in the ass. Someplace Else is not so awful. You got into my life I don't know how you found me it's a tender guitar ballad with a thankfully more minimal arrangement than the overblown production that afflicts the rest of the album. The other song, Regrooge from the Shanghai Surprise soundtrack, is Breath Away From Heaven. In George's words, it's slightly Chinese sounding, but it was supposed to be just slightly Chinese sounding. For what it's worth, the lyrics of this song are pure Harrison poetry. I woke up dreaming with a sigh as the morning light was painting whispers of a joy. This whole song creates a mysterious mood with peculiar chord progressions and vivid imagery, but I often think there's just not enough to keep me invested. Returning to the poppier numbers on the record, we have the ELO sounding This Is Love, a charming up-tempo track co-written by Jeff Lynne. It includes a rare taste of a wah-wah pedal on George's usually clean guitar sound. I like the galloping verses and the... Yeah, those vocals are a cute touch. It's a very Beatles-esque single that also features a joyful music video of George in Hawaii finally looking comfortable playing the part of an 80s pop star. But arguably the most Beatles-esque song on the album is When We Was Fab. This is a weird one for me because I really should like it. It's George finally dipping back into an intentional Beatles sound, making lyrical and sonic references to his old band. But one can't help but feel that this is just Jeff Lynne living out his Beatles fantasy. Hot take, I know. Lynn, who co-wrote the track, is a humongous Beatles fan, whose vision for his band ELO was to pick up where the Beatles left off in 1970. 
you know, when I heard ELO, it was very what we'd been doing on Sgt Pepper. He would go on to helm his ultimate Beatles project, producing the anthology in the mid 90s, and later McCartney's Flaming Pie album. And hey, I can't blame the guy. If I was producing for George Harrison, I'd also want to geek out with my Beatles tribute song as much as possible. But this is hardly a tribute. The lyrics spell out Harrison's dismay more than his joy at Beatlemania. The listener might not pick up on this though, as the song is filled with I Am The Walrus cellos, occasional sitar, and both Ringo Starr's drum fills and Beatle harmonies with Jeff Lynne. The whole song has a murky quality to it, and George's vocals also sound like they're coming through an AM radio, and I, I don't know, I just, I just don't think this song sounds all that authentic to him. The single landed him a number two spot on the US Billboard charts, but I think that's more to do with it being a Beatles throwback than it being a quality recording. But never mind a number two spot, because finally, after 14 years, George Harrison scored his third US number one with I got my mind set on you. Written by Rudy Clark and originally recorded by James Ray in 1962. I've got my mind set on you. I've got my mind set on you. George Harrison covers this peppy track with a pounding drum beat and a flurry of saxophones. This also features a passionate vocal from Harrison, something missing from his follow-up single, When We Was Fab. All I'm spending money. It's one of the songs on the album where I think they really nailed it on the production. This rock reinterpretation of a smooth R&B number sounds just excellent. They even made two different music videos for it. But in my personal opinion, it has suffered slightly from incessant radio play. My local rock and classic hit stations pretty much only play this George Harrison song. Like out of his entire discography, you only ever hear Got My Mind Set On You. This was also a hit in the UK, spending four weeks at the number two spot. A welcome return for George is his home country had never embraced his solo work quite like the US had. And to date, this is the last time that an ex beatle scored a number one hit single in the US. You hear that, Paul? There's still time, buddy. A track that I've really grown to like is Devil's Radio, which was inspired by a church billboard George saw in an English country town that said, Devil's Radio, don't be a broadcaster. I know people found a lot of George's proclamations about God or society to be a bit preachy, but it's part of what I love about him, his point of view on things. And this is quite the rant, let me tell you, probably the most worked up he's been since Wawa. It's white and black like industrial ways. In a rockabilly fashion, he attacks gossip, TV, cynical talk radio, which spreads inaccuracies and falsehoods. Hmm, I wonder what kind of people that could apply to today. It's one of those prophetic George Harrison songs that just makes you really think how much he'd hate social media. It's also one of the rare occasions where George admitted to being inspired by contemporary musical trends. In this case, the stylings of Eurythmics. Harrison also goes after gossip columnists in the track Wreck of the Hesperus, but his main target in this fast-paced rocker is himself. In the funniest song on the album, George playfully laments that he's no spring chicken. He's been plucked, but he's still kicking. A self-deprecating number exploring a midlife crisis could be seen as a bit too cute by half, but it's saved by the upbeat rock stylings of the entire band, particularly Ringo Starr's excellent drumming. Like I said at the top of this review, this is a good album. The songwriting's quite strong and George is sounding terrific. There's also no song that's truly terrible like on previous LPs, but there's two things preventing me from really loving it. The first is the dated production. That late 80s sound that had a chokehold on artists everywhere is just not my thing. It's the same problem I had with Paul McCartney's Flowers in the Dirt album from 1989. Although I will say now, if I may digress for a moment, start the clock, I was too harsh on Flowers in the Dirt. I was grading Paul's albums on somewhat of a curve due to the sheer size of his output, but it deserves higher than a five out of 10. Songs I didn't mention like Distractions, We Got Married and Put It There are really lovely, so there you have it. So yeah, it's Cloud9's production. And the second thing that's preventing me from truly embracing this album is the lack of authentic confessional music from George. Something that is prevalent on every single other record he's ever made. We get the odd angry rant and songs like Fish on the Sand and Just For Today skim the surface of his inner mind, but most I feel like I'm listening to George Harrison at a distance. And with basically no acoustic guitars on the entire LP and Jeff Lynne crowding up the joint, sonically, I'm feeling more removed from George than ever. But still, not a bad LP at all, and it gave him his last US number one, so I can't complain that much. Yeah, seven out of 10. And that pretty much ties a bow on George's 1980s studio album discography. Yeah, I've already covered every record from the decade. <laughs> he still made engaging music during this period, but as you're about to find out, the 1970s was just a more musically rewarding and fun time as far as I'm concerned. Except for Extra Texture, no one was having fun there. The next album on the list is Dark Horse.
Now you might be thinking, no, nah, no way, this guy's a moron. How could he possibly think Dark Horse is better than Cloud9? Guys, it's in the name. It's a dark horse. Let me just set the scene, okay? By the end of 1973, George had easily eclipsed to John and Paul as the most successful ex beatle he had two number one albums with two corresponding number one singles, plus a world first charity benefit gig under his belt. One may have found themselves pondering the question the Beatles were asked ad nauseum in the 60s, when was the bubble going to burst? Well, it turns out 1974 was George's turn to take a flogging. Never one to waste time, George announced to his wife Patty that they should have a divorce this year at Ringo Starr's 1973-74 New Year's Eve party, which I would say was a pretty bad omen for things to come. Their marriage had been falling apart since the end of the last decade, which Eric Clapton noticed and after years of failed attempts was finally able to woo Patty Boyd. I had become bit by bit more and more obsessed with his wife, Patty, and was making amateur kind of inroads into finding out what, what was going on and what, what, what was happening to their relationship. George was no saint himself though. While his own marriage was breaking down, he had an affair with Ringo's star's wife, Maureen, and to add more fuel to the incestuous fire, he and Ronnie Wood of The Faces, later of The Rolling Stones, swapped wives for a brief period. Not sure how that all works, but it was the 70s and I'll just just leave it there. As a result of his womanizing, George's commitment to his Hindu faith was wavering, which wasn't helped by an overly indulgent dependency on drugs and alcohol, particularly cocaine. This was all part of what George called his naughty period. He did, however, make an excellent album in 1974, it just wasn't his. You see, as a way of forgetting his relationship troubles, George completely overcommitted to his work, which included producing the forgotten gem and one of Apple Records' best discoveries, The Place I Love from the band Splinter. Look at these two dorks. These guys right here, they made a great album. By the time this album was ready, it was going to be released on Harrison's new record label instead of Apple, yet another venture which took up a lot of time. But seriously, go and listen to The Place I Love. It's got George's stamp all over it and it's just overflowing with Beatle influence. Maybe I'll make a Patreon video about this album and maybe the other albums that George produced. Oh yeah, I have a Patreon. If you'd like to join, the link is in the description. I'd really appreciate it. Okay, thanks. Now back to the review. This was just one of the many albums that Harrison produced in 1974, adding to Shankar Family and Friends, plus a live album of Indian music from a tour of musicians that Harrison also put together with Shankar. Produced two albums, gone to India, it's got all these 18 musicians together, brought them to England, rehearsed them in my house, got them, filmed them on the Albert Hall, we made their album, toured Europe. And to top it all off, George finished the year with a tour of America, making him the first ex-Beatle to play a run of shows in the United States. Only there was a slight problem. Because he was such a mensch and overcommitted himself to other people's projects, plus all the coke and brandy he was consuming, George Harrison contracted laryngitis and lost his voice on the eve of the tour. What happened? <laughs> This tour, though enjoyed by audiences around the country, received some horrible reviews from major publications like Rolling Stone, who took issue with three key areas. Harrison's heavy inclusion of Indian music, his own ragged vocals, and particularly his refusal to pander to Beatles fans with barely any Fab Four songs on the set list. This led critics like Robert Kreisgau with The Village Voice to nickname the poor guitarist Horse Talk, which is admittedly very funny. After the tour was over by the end of December, Harrison was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. And was trying to make my own album in time to get to America and do a tour. I just had too much on. And returned to England, barely able to open the door of his own home. After that, I'll probably just collapse. I don't know. And somewhere in between all those events, he hastily threw together his own album, released towards the end of the tour, which just so happens to be the next on our list, the misunderstood Dark Horse. I said it wasn't excellent, it's not, but let me tell you why Dark Horse is pretty good actually. First of all, possibly my favorite album artwork from George Harrison's discography. There he is. There's our boy. Many writers over the years have often compared the album to a musical soap opera. Even George Harrison himself likened it to one. Quote, I'm a musician, not a talker. I mean, if you just get my album. album it's like a uh, Peyton Place. You know, it'll tell you exactly what I've been doing. One's called So Sad, one's called Simply Shady. Part of why I like Dark Horse is this element of personal drama. And if this album really is like a soap opera, then the first track, Hari's On Tour, is the opening credits when all the cast is introduced. This is a rare instrumental from George that features Joni Mitchell's backing band, the LA Express. 
who recorded this impromptu after Harrison invited them to Friar Park. This casual approach of various musicians playing at his home studio adds to the sonic mishmash of Dark Horse. No longer did Harrison require his usual discipline bound by expensive London studio schedules. Things became much more loose and relaxed, but this more laid back atmosphere plus having no co-producer cut back on overall consistency and quality. But George wasn't here to be this spiritual superstar anymore. He just wanted to be one of the guys in a band and that's what you get with his first track. Which opened every live show and corresponds to the very fun atmosphere George and the gang were actually having on tour. but it was still brilliant because that band was unbelievable. We then arrive at a trifecta of songs that all tell the story of Harrison's state of mind during his marriage breakdown. First we have Simply Shady, and from those very first growling words, it's clear George's vocals aren't in a good spot. As on Extra Texture, this track is filled with plenty of melodrama, both in the melody and the lyrics, with George once associating this track with the BBC radio drama Mrs Dale's Diary. Musically, Simply Shady may be a bit plodding, but the lyrics are a fascinating insight into George's internal struggle with his failing marriage and infidelities, drug and alcohol addictions, and the consequences of those actions. As he said in I Me Mine, it's about what happens to naughty boys in the music business. If Simply Shady is the drama happening in real time, then the next song, So Sad, is the sobering aftermath. Played mainly on acoustic guitars, it's all about how painful splitting from Patty has been on Harrison and how lonely he is. This song is the inverse of Here Comes the Sun, from the winter has come to eclipse out the sun lyric to the weeping slide guitar riffs on each of the So Sad, So Bad lines. So sad. George was really going for broke in his emo phase. Vocally, this is one of the better tracks off the album and you do really feel his anguish here. A humbling reminder that even though George considered relationships as all part of the material world, he couldn't escape the devastation of a broken marriage and the betrayal of a friend. To close out this triptych of misery, we have Bye Bye Love. Bye Bye Love. Why does this song sound like George on Helium? Bye Bye Happiness. A twist on the Everly Brothers hit that substitutes in Harrison's own lyrics of loss. There goes our lady with a you know who. I hope she's happy. Oh, this is a pretty pointless, but again, insightful look into George spilling the tea on his own drama, but perhaps two songs was enough. It's just kind of bizarre to hear this much intimate information from someone who shunned gossip and craved privacy. Keeping up the soap opera analogy, this is the episode where George jumped the shark. Bye Bye Love also sounds pretty awful and lacks the quality control of his previous efforts, making it the clear weak spot on the album for me. Thankfully, things improved at the end of side one with the funky Maya Love. This is filled with groovy keyboard breaks from Billy Preston, and contains some equally smooth guitar licks from George. Maya, roughly translating to illusion in Sanskrit, is what Harrison was struggling to grapple with most during this period, even going without regular meditation for a couple of years. The song doesn't really go anywhere, but musically, it's the most engaging cut on the album so far, and is a great example of George's affinity for R&B. Sounds like this one really popped off on the Dark Horse tour as well. <laughs> Side 2 begins with George's only ever attempt at a holiday classic. I want to. Ding dong, ding dong. To me, this is the soap opera's like drunken New Year scene where Harrison is partying away the sadness we experienced on side one. The lyrics, ring out the old, ring in the new, shows Harrison's desire to move on from all that was troubling him and start fresh with an attitude of hashtag New Year, New Me. Based on the fun music video, George's first ever as a solo artist, the old is his many Beatle identities, complete with stiff, disturbing smiles, plus... Yesterday, today was... Sorry, what was I saying? Oh yes, more symbolically, I think we can say that Ring Out the Old is Patty Boyd and Ring in the New is Olivia Arias, whom Harrison first met in 1974 and would later go on to be his wife. <laughs> to further the metaphor, George even put an image of Olivia's eyes on the second side's face label. I like this track, it's got a massive arrangement and I feel like you get a real sense of the silliness and joy. Part early 60s Phil Spector Christmas recording, part 70s glam rock and containing more lyrics from the various Frank Crisp carvings at Friar Park. Unfortunately, it was released 
quite late in the year and failed to make an impact as a holiday single. The other single from Dark Horse is the title track, which copped a top 20 spot in the US, but became Harrison's first single to fail to chart in the UK, marking Dark Horse as the period George's home turf began turning their back on him. More than perhaps any song on the album, Dark Horse shows the most visceral extent to how hoarse George's voice was on his US tour. Having only recorded the track in LA just a couple of days before the tour began. Many were insulted that he even released a single with his voice in the state that it was, but personally, I think it helps to tell the story of the album. Plus it gives him this Tom Waits-like gravitas. Or as Harrison said, I thought I sounded like Louis Armstrong. George meant Dark Horse in the Northern English sense of the phrase, of someone who carries out clandestine sexual relationships, which he emphasizes with the line, running on a dark race course. But it also carries the more traditional meaning of revealing himself as the unexpected victor in the early post beatles solo careers. The irony being that this was the album that shattered that position going forward. There's an early acoustic take that he recorded months before where his voice is in great shape. You thought that you knew what it was when. But to me, this is a pretty solid track regardless. Musically, it's just a very enjoyable tune. I like the flutes and smooth harmonies. Plus it contains some of the best lyrics on the album. The second to last track is also one of the best. Harrison's song co-written with Ronnie Wood, the soul-infused Far East Man. From the garbled opening where he dedicates the track to Frank Sinatra. tells him to include this one at Caesar's Palace on his next live album. This song, to me, brings to mind the same party from Ding Dong Ding Dong, but hours later with Harrison leaning on a mic and singing with all his heart to a crowd of passed out party goers. It's a more hopeful tune as Harrison muses on the emotional weight of what he's gone through that year and ultimately deciding that he's got to follow his heart and rise above the bullshit. I really enjoy this track. I dig the way it slowly builds to Harrison's wailing vocal at the end. And with band members like Andy Newmark from Sly and the Family Stone and legendary session musician Willie Weeks on bass, this is another song, one of the first ones, that captures Harrison's burgeoning talent for soul music. One of Harrison's better experiences of 1974 was his long-awaited return to India where he had his quote, most fantastic experience, which involved him traveling with Ravi Shankar to the Hindu holy city of Vrindavan, where Harrison rediscovered his faith and took part in chanting Vedic hymns for hours, which quote, melted all the bullshit away. <laughs> turn this blissful chanting into the closing song, It Is He, Jai Sri Krishna, and it might actually be my favourite track on the album. I know it's kind of absurd, like the Moog, the Wobble Board. Why do I like this song? I think it's the chanting. It translates to praising Lord Krishna and Goddess Radha, and I don't know, there's just this ludicrous ecstasy on here that I really feel. Like George bottled that bliss and turned it into an insanely catchy earworm that every Every time I hear it, I just... George's voice also sounds great. The flutes, a musical reference to Krishna, are really soft and lovely. This blending of world instruments allowed for a new musical category, which some christened Country and Eastern or Krishna Skiffle. You know, it's a very George thing to have an album of such drama and despair and then cap it off with a jaunty song that refuses to take itself seriously. It's kind of nice that he opens and closes this LP with a bit of joy. The feel-good closing credits to a very dramatic season of the George Harrison whirlwind soap opera. <laughs> It was the last overtly devotional song released for many, many years. And look, I know they were contentious with the critics, but I, I really love these kind of songs. Like if you've never heard this track before, I guarantee you haven't heard anything else like it. It caps off an album that is by no means Harrison's best, but I think it's one of his most intriguing records. Many songs heard in a vacuum may not hold up as anything spectacular, but it's the context from which they were created that makes Dark Horse such a ride. I believe that the urgency of getting the album done helped to uncensor Harrison to write songs about things that were truly afflicting him at the time. And in that hasty, emotional frame of mind, George Harrison compiled something that has the energy akin to a post-punk album. It's emotional, a little bit weird, and brutally revealing. 
And that weirdness and stark honesty is why I prefer it over the guarded gloss of Cloud9. Although it was lambasted by critics at the time, I think it's become only more compelling and fascinating as the decades have gone by. So I'm gonna give it the tiniest bump up from Cloud9 with a 7.1 out of 10. Jay Sri Krishna. Much like the previous two years, George Harrison was having a rough 1976. Recently I've been more of a lawyer. <laughs> We'll I'm come to court. So. <laughs> With two different lawsuits plus a near fatal case of hepatitis brought on by too much drinking. In spite of all this though, the year began to slowly improve and he managed to create one of his most upbeat and impressive albums of his whole career. It's the next on our list, 33 and a third. Named for the fact that Harrison was 33 and a third himself when recording the album, as well as the speed at which a vinyl LP plays on a turntable, this is such a welcome return of some of Harrison's sunniest pop songs and it couldn't have come at a better time for George. 1976 was a turning point in his life where his circle of friends shifted from the seedy remnants of the LA music scene to people like Eric Idle and the Monty Python crew. He appeared on Rutland Weekend Television where he debuted the Pirate Song, co-written with Idle. I like to be a pirate. It's a pirate's life for me. All my friends are pirates and the same the BBC. I got a jolly Roger, it's a black and white and fast. So get out of your skull and crossbones and I run it off your man. And to join them for a performance of the Lumberjack song on Broadway, dressed as a Mountie. George was also doing unprecedented levels of promotion for the album, with plenty of interviews and music videos, a total first for him. He was even a guest on the relatively new show, Saturday Night Live, where he not only showed off his deadpan comedic chops. Live from New York. It's Saturday night. He also played a legendary duet with Paul Simon, performing a breathtaking rendition of Homeward Bound and Here Comes the Sun. And each town looks the same to me, the movies and the factories, and every stranger's face I see reminds me that I long to be Homeward Bound. Seriously, one of the best things on YouTube. He was clean shaven, appearing healthier, plus he was often wearing that cozy cardigan, so he was always looking cuddly and sweet. And he was back recording in his home studio, assisted by the tightest group of musicians yet. Billy Preston and Richard T on keys, Willie Weeks on bass, and Alvin Taylor on drums, to name a few. Plus, after producing by himself on his last few albums, Harrison had the good sense to enlist saxophonist Tom Scott with production assistance, which really made a world of difference as this record sounds wonderful. It shimmers and shines with open clarity particularly when compared to the murky extra texture from the year before. Right from the jump, you can tell this is a renewed George Harrison. The first 10 seconds of the opener, Woman Don't You Cry For Me, are better than anything from the entirety of Extra Texture. From the rumbly slap bass, stabbing clavinet, and Harrison's trademark slide guitar, this is another fantastic album opener. Written back in 1969 and almost included on his debut post Beatle album, it's actually the first song where George Harrison experimented on slide guitar after Delaney Bramlett handed him a bottleneck slide and Harrison's iconic sound was born. You can actually hear it as an acoustic demo on the 50th anniversary deluxe set of All Things Must Pass. And going from that, it's just really wonderful to hear how his technique and musical stylings evolved over the course of six years where it became a stellar blues funk return to form on 33 and a third. Gonna leave you here. The previous few years showed a faltering in Harrison's commitment to his Hindu faith, as is evident on Extra Texture, where for once there were no overt theological statements or mentions of Krishna. This was also because Harrison had learned that if he harped on too much about such philosophies, they would be panned by critics who were still fairly sour on him. But on 33 and a third, Harrison learned how to incorporate Indian theology in a subtler fashion, where he would shift the focus of the songs to elicit the feelings and the spirit of the teachings instead of what many critics unfairly deemed as lecture and preaching of these practices. George showcases this talent on the gorgeous song, Dear One. It's a song dedicated to Paramahansa Yogananda, who wrote the 1946 book, Autobiography of a Yogi, which Harrison said had a quote, great deal of influence on my life. Harrison's only song ever written in open A tuning. It's a blissful mix of synthesizers and harmonies. And I just love the way George's voice bends around the notes in the song's first section. This is one of the prominent examples of George singing as well as playing in a style clearly inspired by Indian music. The chorus switches to a big pop production akin to something off Abbey Road. My spirit sings to you now. 
giving this song a lot of Beatles colour. Great track. The maturity of George's spiritual compositions is explored further on the synth-heavy See Yourself. This is actually a song written all the way back in 1967 after Paul McCartney controversially answered honestly about his taking LSD when the question came up in a televised interview. Well, four times. But you're asking me the question. You want me to be honest. I'll be honest, you know. I said, but if you've got any worries about this having an effect on kids, then you don't show it. Decades later, Harrison said, It just seems strange to me because we'd been trying to get him to take it for about 18 months. And then it just seemed funny that one day he's on the television talking all about it. Nonetheless, this song is a defense of Paul's decision, as George sings that it's easier to criticize somebody else than to see yourself. A song built around a series of synths, it's a credit to Harrison that during this period where synths were all the rage and guitar music was apparently dead, he managed to utilize them seamlessly into his music whilst retaining his unique guitar flourishes. Yet another composition from the late 60s is finally realized with the charming, beautiful girl. Some have pointed out that this song sounds like it could have come from Rubber Soul and I quite agree. It's a lovely guitar ballad with gorgeous twin guitar solos that run counter to the melody. Another great use of Harrison's songs within the song technique. Originally written about Patty Boyd, but never completed until he fell in love with Olivia Arias. George didn't write that many overt boy falls in love with girl numbers, so you sort of have to cherish tracks like this because it really is one of his sweetest love songs. The album contains a few of these as a matter of fact. You've got yet another cover of an American classic with the buoyant True Love originally by Cole Porter. It's a massive improvement from the vindictive take on Bye Bye Love from Dark Horse. He's crooning all over this one. He's George Crooney. Oh my God, I'm sorry, please keep watching. And also features this <laughs> hilarious music video. The Burt Bacharach like Learning How To Love You closes the album. This one took me a while to really appreciate because it can seem like a fairly drowsy end to what is an upbeat album, but there's a lot of beauty in this love ballad. From the sophisticated arrangement by Tom Scott to the exemplary guitar solo from Harrison. It's like a smooth jazz version of his Beatle hit, Something. Harrison's singles were also top notch, beginning with the track, This Song. One of the lawsuits I mentioned moments ago was Bright Tune suing George Harrison for the accidental musical plagiarism in his song, My Sweet Lord, which has melodic similarities to He's So Fine by the Chiffons. This was a lengthy and costly battle for Harrison that he ultimately ended up losing. But Harrison took this controversy that was a scourge on his soul for years and turned it into a sunny and catchy pop song. I mean, that really speaks to who George Harrison was, I think. Harrison said that he wrote it to, quote, exercise the paranoia about songwriting that the episode had fostered in him. It's a great tune, lots of puns and tongue-in-cheek humour regarding his copyright case. It features a playful cameo from Eric Idle suggesting it does in fact sound like other songs. Unlike His Name Is Legs, this humour actually translates. It's self-aware commentary that pokes fun of music plagiarism with an upbeat funk groove. It's like proto Weird Al. The music video also shows that he has a sweater vest version of that same cardigan print. Incredible. The other single, Crackerbox Palace, is another cheerful track. It's got some of that classic Beatles cartoonish whimsy to it, kind of like Savoy Truffle, and features yet another excellent and zany music video from Harrison that gives us a tour of his own Crackerbox Palace, Friar Park. It's the track It's What You Value has a similar vibe to it to this song, but at a slower tempo. It features a marimba in the chorus, which I really like. It's catchy and it's got a great funk sound. George Harrison and John Lennon both have these songs that sound like they're the opening credits of Saturday Night Live. Which makes sense because this album features musicians almost entirely from that New York studio scene of the 70s. George's release before this was Extra Texture, which was his soul album, and a genre he'd been experimenting with since Far East Man off of Dark Horse. But it's not until his second and vastly superior tribute to Smokey Robinson on 33 and a third that he really masters the genre. This is an elegant and warm dedication to one of Harrison's music idols, featuring a rare non-slide guitar solo that recalls Carl Perkins. By 1976, Harrison was more or less a has-been in the UK due to the emergence of punk shifting people away from his funky and 
playful American vibe. But George knew this and played to his strengths, making an album that featured soul, synth pop, southern rock, and funk sounds that were still a la mode in the United States. And what a relief 33 and a Third was for George Harrison fans. After two disappointing albums, it wasn't clear if he'd ever return to his early 70s power. Thankfully, George put his naughty years behind him and focused on making a confident album that may have been light on heady spiritual musings, but featured first class songwriting and superb production. He kept his usual inner turmoil at bay and reconnected with his pop sensibilities whilst maintaining musical complexity and expertise. As he said on Countdown in 1977, But I think generally the album's nice because it's, it's happy. Like, we go through so many crazy things in our lives and I've been up and down and up and down and the, the music always reflects it. I think my last album was more down. And this one is just happy and up. That's what I like about it. Me too. Seven and a third out of ten. After George's 1987 record, Cloud Nine, he was reminded of the joys of making music with friends and got together with the likes of Bob Dylan, Tom Petty, Jeff Lynne, and Roy Orbison to record not just one, but two albums as the tongue-in-cheek band Traveling Wilburys. I'll talk more about this supergroup and their albums after the main list, but suffice it to say, George Harrison was having fun making music again, which eventually buoyed him into his first tour in 17 years. Taking place entirely in Japan. Hi, Tamori. Hi, Tamari. Nice to be here. Hello. George played a limited run of 12 shows to well-behaved crowds, which wrapped up at the end of 1991. They even made a live album out of the tour, which again, I will be discussing after the core list of studio albums. George also played a one-off show at the Royal Albert Hall in 1992, marking his first time playing live in London since 1969. It was a benefit for the Natural Law Party, a political group founded on the principles of George's beloved transcendental meditation. This was to be his final full-length concert of his life. From there, George was pulled back into the world of the Fab Four, as the multi-year preparations for the Beatles anthology were underway. Anthology was a huge undertaking, and aside from everything else, it introduced us to George's love of the ukulele, an instrument he'd become partial to in the 80s and 90s, so much so that his son, Danny, recalls that George was rarely without one in hand. That's really what he was like around the house all day, just playing ukulele, and uh, he'd sing everything on the uke. The 90s were an otherwise quiet time for George, who could be found relaxing with his main hobby, gardening, and occasionally taking up residence in Hawaii. Hello, Homer. I'm George Harrison. <gasps> oh my god. Oh my god! Where did you get that brownie? Over there, there's a big pile of them. <laughs> oh man. Wow, what a nice fella. There were two key events that happened to George in the second half of the decade. The first was being diagnosed with lung cancer and being told he had six months to live, but battled on far longer than doctors predicted. The second event occurred in December 1999, when a disturbed intruder broke into Friar Park and stabbed George multiple times before Olivia and George apprehended him. And didn't let it affect him. But it definitely took years off his life, you know? So if you're trying to fight cancer and then you're trying to stay alive for something like that, you know, it's got to it's got to take it out of you. You know, this attack, combined with the fact that George's cancer had metastasized to his brain, meant that he knew for certain death was looming. So he phoned his old buddy Jeff Lynne and enlisted the help of his now adult son Danny to record his final album of songs that he had been working on throughout the 90s and beyond. After a few working titles such as Portrait of a Leg End and Your Planet Is Doomed Volume One, George landed on the title Brainwashed. George Harrison was in the unique position where, unlike John Lennon and so far, thankfully, Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr, he knew that this would be the last album of his career and life. He tragically died before it was finished, but he left a roadmap for Jeff Lynne and Danny to complete it, which they did in late 2002, one year on from his death. It also created the longest gap between George Harrison's studio albums, 15 years. The album, which was recorded reel to reel on analog tape, was mostly completed with essentially all backing tracks done. It was almost as if my dad had the whole thing mapped out and we were just these lab rats trying to find our way through the maze that hadn't quite been finished yet. George even recorded himself humming the string parts that would be on one of the tracks. And what George decided to leave us with is an album recorded simply with bare bones production and mostly acoustic instruments, but with unparalleled depth and emotional resonance. It's not high tech and it's not a rap or techno or whatever version of it. It opens with George asking, Give me uh, plenty of that guitar. And sure enough, the jangly sounds of acoustic guitars oblige on the track Any Road. Strumming alongside it is a banjo ukulele hybrid called the banjo lele, which springs into 
gear as George takes us on a road trip of his own life and philosophy. This is a song George had been toying with since the late 1980s, which is why it has a distinct Wilbury flavour to it. He actually debuted it in 1997 on VH1 during his final TV interview. I've been travelling on a boat and a plane and a car and a bike and a bus and a train. It chugs along happily and sets the perfect tone for the album. The production is noticeably scaled down from Cloud Nine, and as a result, George's voice sits at the forefront as he sings. If you don't know where you're going, yeah, there's no reverb or glossy effects anywhere on this album. This grants listeners access to what George always wanted in his songs, the pure emotion above all else. Back in 1970, George released a song called Awaiting On You All that ruffled some clerical collars by cheekily claiming that the Pope owns 51% of general notice. The specific claim was false and of course a joke, but it served to highlight the corrupt and hypocritical business of the Catholic Church. 30 years later on Brainwashed, George's song P2 Vatican Blues, Last Saturday Night, goes after the same institution on how the truth is hiding, lurking, banking, things they do at night. This good old fashioned 12 Bar Blues track demonstrates George Harrison's Beatle era sense of humour. And that his assessment of organised religion is as biting as ever. One of my favourite elements of Brainwashed is the incredibly personal insight into George Harrison's psyche. He has multiple songs on here that serve as striking confessional statements. Three of them in particular are sequenced together. The first is the song Pisces Fish. This is a lovely tune about the duality, the contradiction, the paradox of George Harrison. It also happens to be his star sign, and in the world of astrology, Pisces are known for being emotionally fluid, vacillating between feelings, and being very in tune with their emotions and those of others. They also have contradictory natures, which is what George explores here. Guided by his water sign, the song contains real imagery of rowers on a river, as well as the river that runs through his soul, and seeking to swim unbounded in an ocean of bliss. The music is delightful as it laps around the listener's ears, but the lyrics are some of my favourite in all of George Harrison's discography. From George looking once again to silence for the answer, to the words that sum up the song and the man himself. Sometimes my life it seems like fiction. Some of the days it's really quite serene. I'm living proof of all life's contradictions. One half's going where the other half's just been. Many songs are modelled off Bob Dylan's musical stylings, and Pisces Fish takes this model to new heights. I also love the way that he says beer in this song. In a vat of beer. In a vat of beer. I love that. The second song relating to the nature of George's existence is Looking For My Life. George was a complex person, but contains straightforward values. And here he's letting us in on the overwhelming feeling of entering the daunting 21st century. Nobody seems to listen to anything anyway to these days, do they? All got cloth ears. Especially me. Things these days are not so simple and he's insecure about keeping up, even lamenting that he never got any GCEs. Primarily made up of strummed acoustic guitars, this is a humbling song that progresses pleasantly as George continues to search for meaning in his ever-changing life. We then have the third song covering the inside of Harrison's mind, Rising Sun. The verses in minor key explore his experience on the avenue of sinners and being taken for a ride on the street of villains with the devil as a guide. But then the chorus hits and we ascend to a higher plane of hope and tranquility as George, now in major key, reassures the listener that you can feel your life begin in the here and now. The rising sun is inside of you, the universe at play inside your DNA. You're a billion years old today. George demonstrates more beguiling yet restrained slide guitar that warms and calms you like a brilliant sunrise. The song reminds me of a story uh, Olivia Harrison tells about George when she recalls him looking at this beautiful sunset. There was this amazing sunset, just orange sky. And he said, that is what I want to do. He wanted to be able to create that sunset. But George's true guitar genius appears on the next track, a rare but important instrumental Mawa Blues. Named after Raga Mawa, George's favourite Indian classical raga traditionally played at sunset, Mawa Blues is one of the most significant pieces of music George Harrison ever created. Ever since his solo trip to India in 1966 where he discovered his love for Indian ragas, George devoted his life to creating music that blended the Indian aspiration of spiritual connection with the Western instrumental form, primarily through the inflections of his own slide guitar. And since George has repeatedly said both in songs 
and in life, that words and lyrics often do not do justice to this pursuit, how perfect then that he should ultimately reach this divine union by letting his music speak for him. The harmonic shape of the piece rolls back and forth like waves gently lapping on a beach, as blissful percussion, elegant strings and ethereal keyboards support George Harrison's graceful slide guitar, the sparkling tone of his six-string instrument resonating like the call from beyond. Mawa Blues is perhaps the greatest guitar piece he ever recorded. In classic Harrison fashion, it's not flashy or complicated, but impossibly moving and celestial. It's one of Paul McCartney's all-time favourite compositions, and also posthumously earned George Best Pop Instrumental Performance at the 2004 Grammys. Danny Harrison has mentioned that George's favourite number was seven, and so when Danny was sequencing the tracks, he placed his favourite of the songs, Stuck Inside a Cloud, in the number seven spot. And that was the highest honour I could have given a track on the album, was to put it track seven. That is it's my favourite, that track. I love it. This is a chilled out song featuring a rather anxious George Harrison. The lyrics exhibit a man sleeping very little, crying out loud, and losing his will to eat. I first thought that this was a song about his battles with cancer before I learned that it was written years before his diagnosis. This deceptively upbeat song is one of turmoil for Harrison. What exactly he's burdened with is unclear, but I can't help but feel deep sympathy for his struggle. On the track Run So Far, George employs the Hawaiian slack key guitar technique, something he no doubt mastered living out his days in Maui, and it makes for an inviting listen. This was a song written by Harrison and originally recorded by Eric Clapton in 1989. I much prefer Harrison's version, with his appealing harmonies and smooth rhythm, it creates a relaxing and tranquil state of mind. The calming mood continues on Never Get Over You, a leisurely but touching song to Olivia. It features chord changes that progress one half step at a time, something Harrison's employed before in previous songs, but the tension this progression creates is countered by touching lyrics in Harrison's smooth and expressive voice. I mentioned previously that Harrison formed a love for the ukulele back in the late 80s, which is showcased marvelously on the LP's one cover song, Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea. This track is actually remixed from a 1991 television appearance for Jules Holland where George merrily plays with a bunch of mates to this delightful 1930s number made famous by Cab Calloway, a favourite of Harrison's. There's not much else to say here other than the charm is positively spilling out of this track. George and the ukulele go so well together, it's criminal that this is his only album that features the instrument prominently, especially considering how much he loved it. The genesis of the penultimate track, Rocking Chair in Hawaii, goes all the way back to 1970 during the All Things Must Pass sessions. Here, George was channeling his pre-Perkins guitar heroes, Jimmy Rogers and Hank Williams. Based off Williams' Long Gone Lonesome Blues, She's long, long gone. George can be heard yodeling all the way through this early country demo. At the end of his career, he resurrected this country mood by giving it a smooth South Sea update. The undulating groove of this song, paired with the genuine seductiveness of George's voice and suggestive lyrics, makes this one of the most sultry tracks of his career. I really didn't expect the second last song on George's final album to be this sexy. What underlines the creation of this album is that George Harrison knew he was going to die. He knew he was about to leave his body, and so wrote and recorded one last song for us all to grapple with. And that song is Brainwashed. <laughs> In this final number, George runs through a litany of institutions that he believes have brainwashed us. Brainwashed in our childhood, brainwashed by the school, brainwashed... From the rules of our teachers and schools, to the press, leaders, kings, queens, the Dow Jones, the media, the military. And from these problems, he provides the ultimate answer. God, God, God. George wasn't mincing words. He was really like, hey, so here's everything wrong with the world. It's all kind of fucked up, but I've been telling you from the start of my solo career what the solution is. Maybe you'll finally listen this time. This is one of the ballsiest ways to close an album you know is going to be your last. Hearing George Harrison sing Brainwashed by Mobile Phones almost doesn't sound right, like it's that prophetic. Like, of course, we know we're brainwashed by our phones, but back in 2001, this is what mobile phones looked like. It was like the man had a glimpse of the 21st century and was like, mm, 
No thanks, that'll be all for me. It's all delivered with a defiant rock attitude, which eventually breaks into a calm interlude of Indian instruments, backing a reading from Patanjali's How to Know God. The soul does not love, it is love itself. It does not exist, it is existence itself. It does not know, it is knowledge itself. How to Know God, page 130. This brief guide pointing people in the God-conscious direction makes way for more recitations against the brainwashers, each delivered more fervently than the last. No longer was George merely accepting tolerance with a that's the way it goes attitude. This return to defiant protest song borrows from the anger of the late 60s, which after 30 years was starting to feel appropriate again. This album was released in 2002, but it didn't catch on properly until 2003, right as a new anti-war sentiment was rising up from a post 9-11 society. This message, George sent us from beyond was more relevant than ever. Just before the core song comes to an end, an embattled George cries out I just won't accept defeat. as we wind down to a single harmonium drone, which in Simon Lang's words represent the unchanging eternal nature of the soul. Then the two voices of George and Danny Harrison break into the traditional Sanskrit prayer Nama Parvati. Nama Parvati Patae Hara Hara. A father and son singing in unison with only the occasional tabla. Indian philosophy teaches that religious chants are the roots of all music, and here George honors this notion with dignity and reverence. I will never forget listening to this part of the song for the first time. I didn't know it was coming, and it just completely stopped me in my tracks. I just found it to be so powerful. Every time I hear it, it's so deeply moving. George was able to finally, without the pretense of commercial pop, perform his devotional song, his bhajan. It translates to surrender to Shiva, Parvati's Lord. Shiva is the destroyer of ignorance, the great Lord, the eternal Lord. These two core parts of the song underline the musical and spiritual vision of George Harrison himself, a reluctant rock star with an incisive point of view, but whose ultimate goal was to live a quiet, devoted existence. The ending to Brainwashed is a remarkably fitting conclusion to George Harrison's musical career. It is the only album written and recorded beyond the course of a decade, beginning in the late 80s all the way to the early 2000s, making it a musical odyssey of the final chapter of Harrison's life. You know, David Bowie's final album released two days before his death, Black Star, is highly revered in music circles, as it should be. But I believe that George's swan song strikes a similarly profound note. No, it's not as innovative as Bowie's music, but because Harrison was never concerned with sounding contemporary, this album, free of any production dressing, has a remarkable timeless quality to it. Musically, it may appear rather simple, but listening deeper, Brainwashed is an elegant, candid, and profoundly reflective record. A parting gift from a wonderful soul. Seven and a half out of 10. Oh, just gonna get my jacket back on. Whew. Alrighty. It's hard to believe that just two and a half years was considered a significant break between albums. But for George Harrison, who had released an LP every year of the 70s except for 71, taking a year off was a rare and much deserved novelty. After the groovy and cosmopolitan 33 and a third in 1976, Harrison essentially took a gap year in 77 and embarked on a cross-continental trip with Olivia attending the Formula One World Championship. It was a year when he reveled in his love for cars, bonded with some of the finest racers on the circuit like Jackie Stewart and Nicky Lauda, and didn't write a single scrap of music. Oh, and he also got a fierce perm that's contentious amongst Harrison fans to this day. Maybe I should have got a perm for this video. <laughs> I'm absolutely kidding, don't worry. <laughs> oh, it's starting to rain. Growing his friendship with the Python crew, he helped develop Eric Idle's Beatles parody film, The Rattles, All You Need Is Cash, which even features Harrison in a cameo role. So, Stig Injured by Big Valerie. The film is hilarious and you can watch me talk about it here. George also started compiling his song manuscripts for what would turn into his autobiography, I Me Mine. This is like its third or fourth edition now. They've added a lot of stuff into it. And as 1977 turned into 78, George and Olivia learned that they were going to be parents for the first time and went on vacation to Hawaii where the refreshed Harrison entered a highly creative period as he began writing the songs that would appear on the next album on our list, the lush and lovely self-titled George Harrison. George's days of the Beatles, lawsuits, cocaine, alcohol, critical lambasing and divorces were finally over. 
the yin of extra texture flipped to the yang of a relaxed and genuinely happy George Harrison. And as he was someone whose music always reflected his emotional state, this album is George's most blissful and optimistic. Man, I love this record. There's a welcome return to themes of nature on here, which I love. George was taking magic mushrooms in Hawaii, which, are you kidding me? We get a return of George's psychedelic music? Amazing. Punk, disco, and heavy metal, three prevailing music categories in England at the time that didn't appeal at all to George Harrison, who would admit to having no clue what his audience expected of him, but I don't think he really cared. There's not even any rock and roll on this album. Instead, we get breezy, tropical tinged soft rock, expertly co produced by another former student of Ravi Shankar, Russ Teitelman. This ain't no goofy ass gone tropo. These sun kissed songs have a lavish elegance that positively melts the stresses off your body. As usual, Harrison opens with one of the album's highlights the infectiously catchy Love Comes to Everyone. <laughs> brand new sound of shimmery guitars fed through the Roland chorus effects pedal coats the listener's ears. This phasing effect gives the guitar a richer, thicker sound that can be heard all throughout this LP. It's also got probably my favourite bass line in any George Harrison song. So to yeah, Willie Weeks really popped off on that one. Similarly, as on his previous record, this album has no overt Krishna or God references, but George's spirituality is still vibrating all throughout. It takes time to love, comes to that mini Moog solo from Steve Winwood is just kick ass. Sometimes you can get kind of intellectual about critiquing a song, but this track is just a vibe. The whole thing is so f***ing groovy. Underrated single from a heavily underrated album. Oh, it's really coming down out there. Things then simmer down for a discarded Beatles song, Circa the White Album, the track Not Guilty. You can hear how the song sounded on the 50th anniversary release of the Beatles self-titled record when the Fab Four took 102 takes to nail it down. <laughs> Back then, a less confident Harrison played a straight rock version with the boys. Ten years go by, and a more self-assured Harrison gives this number a slinky jazz pop mood. The descending chords are a classic Harrison motif, and they cast a mysterious intrigue over the song. The lyrics speak to the drama at the time regarding the trip to India, the Maharishi, and the fledgling apple core. Hope this rain provides like a nice lo-fi chill ambiance. Speaking of the Beatles, one of Harrison's most beloved hits, Here Comes the Sun, gets an unexpected sequel with, you guessed it, Here Comes the Moon. Unlike the Guitar Gently Weep sequel on Extra Texture, this is an excellent pairing with his Abbey Road hit. Is it better? No, but there aren't many songs in general that are better than Here Comes the Sun. Unlike that track, Here Comes the Moon isn't a metaphor for anything, but a literal tribute to what George calls the mother to the stars at night. This dreamy, ethereal atmosphere fades in to make way for an incredibly bright guitar tone and George's gorgeous harmonies. It goes back to the lush psychedelia of songs like Sun King from Abbey Road. It's even got the very Beatles-esque oh, yeah. in the chorus. This is one of the songs George came up with when tripping on magic mushrooms in Maui. He later told the story, the sun was setting over the ocean and it gets pretty stunning even when you're not on mushrooms. I was blissed out and then I turned round and saw a big full moon rising. I laughed and thought it was about time someone, and it may as well be me, gave the moon its due. Isn't that a great image? One of my favorite George Harrison stories. And yeah, really lovely track. The chimes that open and close the song are the icing on the lunar cake. The trippy Silas Ivan times continue on the track Soft Hearted Hannah. This is a play-by-play -play of Harrison's magic mushroom trip in the isolated community of Hannah in Maui. The riff is inspired by an earlier Harrison track, Deep Blue. It's got this ooky kooky magical mystery tour vibe, but musically features an eccentric ragtime piano and dobro slide guitar. There's a real Disney villain song quality to the chorus. Then somebody old and asked did I come for? and the influence of Monty Python is evident in the quirky lyrics. Probably the strangest series of words in any of George's recordings. I love the trippy sound effects in the last minute of the song when the tape speeds up and slows down, altering the pitch. It's, it's just cool. This is the kind of shit I didn't realize I was missing from George Harrison. 
George also copped his most successful single in years with the song Blow Away. This features another classic Harrison songwriting device of the changing weather reflecting his changing mood. The structure and feeling of the song though is pure McCartney. It's a vivid picture and the chorus is filled with optimism. Musically, it's rather quaint, but the message resonates nicely with an album that is fueled with the same sunny outlook. Blow away, blow away, blow away. The song came from a time when George had to fix a hole in his roof when it was raining really heavily, and it is literally raining right now, pretty hard, and he was in a foul mood, but then he realized that soon the clouds would part and he could be happy. All I got to be and you know what, I love this for George. He'd spent so much of the mid 70s in a bit of a downward spiral. So see him choosing happiness is a welcome change. All I gotta do is to, to love you. All I gotta be is a, be happy. Blow away, blow away, blow away. Another single that didn't quite fare as well is Harrison's tribute to his Formula One buddies, Faster. It's a ballad about one of George's true passions that contributes to the many contradictions of a man who loved nature and was attracted to peace and quiet, but who also happened to be obsessed with race car driving. He sums it up nicely in I Me Mine, actually. He's a master of going faster. I know that racing is to a lot of people dopey, maybe from a spiritual point of view. Motor cars, polluters, killers, maimers, noisemakers. Good racing, though, involves heightened awareness for the competitors. Those drivers have to be so together in their concentration, and the handful of them who are the best have had some sort of expansion of their consciousness. I'm gonna pop you up here. How's that look? There you go. It's George. And this is the angle George takes with Faster. Although the chorus is rather stirring and the lyrics and the verses tell a compelling fable of fame, friendship, and danger, the main hook just isn't all that catchy, but there's still plenty of redeeming qualities that make Faster an enjoyable track for me. The album also features two of George Harrison's best love songs back to back. The first is Dark Sweet Lady, a Spanish Hawaiian inspired dedication to his beautiful wife. George's love songs were always ambiguous as to whether they were about God or a woman, or sometimes both, but there's nothing vague here. This is George's song about being rescued by the lady who would remain with him until his death, Olivia. My dark, sweet lady. And what a pretty song this is. This is such a pretty and alluring song from George Harrison, who also offers up a delightful and moving Spanish guitar solo. The production really shines on songs like this. Wonderful arrangement, beautiful instrumentation with the angelic harp and island percussion. It kind of sounds like the Disney song, Kiss the Girl from The Little Mermaid. Not a single word, go on and kiss the girl. And in fact, features the seven notes that make up the melody from yet another Disney song, Beauty and the Beast. And this is years before the release of either film. George really in his Alan Menken era on this album. His other love song definitely feels like it leans more towards God, titled Your Love Is Forever. This was originally going to be an instrumental, but Harrison's co-producer convinced George to write some lyrics. Either way, this is a stunning composition. Paul McCartney is often the Beatle people point to as having a true gift for melody, and he does. But I think people overlook George Harrison's superb melodic ability as well. And nowhere is this more evident than on Your Love Is Forever. It opens with a radiant guitar passage wrapped in a gentle calm meshing Eastern and Western musical aesthetics. The lyrics convey imagery of summer and winter passing, but declaring that your love is forever. Sincere, tender, heavenly. Truly one of his greatest love songs. There's a warm tropical vibe to this whole album, conveyed most vividly on the song Soft Touch. Opening with that bedroom pop guitar sound and featuring a riff lifted straight from the horn line from his 1970 song, Run of the Mill. Here, Harrison sought to convey the atmosphere around him. The wind, the cool breeze blowing, the palm trees, the new moon rising. Oh, and the lyrics, this is really cute. The lyrics taken from the LP show S-O-N, sun, instead of S-U-N, sun. Which I think is a lovely and touching tribute to his only child in what is another charming soft rock number. See, as a warm sun rises. Gorgeous, George. As a way to prepare for this new album, George re-listened to his post-Beatles debut, All Things Must Pass. And you can really hear the influence on the buoyant album closer, If You Believe. The 
slide guitar riffs, horns, and orchestral strings really bring to mind that 60s Phil Spector sound on this catchy track co-written by the Dreamweaver himself, Gary Wright. I can be like I'm a bird. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little trick we learned from the ink spots. <laughs> this is one of George's most upbeat songs on his most upbeat album. I just love that this record is bookended with songs that send the message that if you love and if you believe, you'll get love in return. Like it's all the same calming stuff George used to sing about, but with a more welcoming approach, a softer touch, if you will. You just finished this album with a big smile on your face, and I love that. By the end of the 70s, George's interest in music had waned significantly, and many thought he'd lost his edge. But this only allowed George to take more time away from the business and discover new themes like family and domestic bliss, which Paul McCartney had exhibited in his early 70s output, and John Lennon was about to explore on his Double Fantasy album in 1980. This theme carried with it music that was more more gentle and melodic with lyrics focusing on love and nature, which also makes George Harrison one of his most Beatles-esque albums. Although this kind of softer music is often deemed lightweight, it's important to remember that in 1978, George was going through a lot of emotional changes, with his father dying, his son Danny being born, and getting married again. I believe George was seeing God in a lot of new elements of his life, making this album that much richer and full of heart. He was a renewed man and said as much at the time. I think what happened between this album and the last album is that everything has been happening nice for me. My life is getting better all the time and I'm happy. And I think that it's reflected in the music. The yin yang cycle continued, however, as his next album was The Bitter Somewhere in England. George also didn't do that much to promote this record, so it kind of came and went without much fanfare, but for me, this is a joyful, breezy, and deeply romantic album that sees George Harrison close out the 1970s on a high. It's probably not for everyone, but if you like your music lush and cheerful, perhaps you're a Japanese city pop fan, or if you're just looking to hear an updated Beatles throwback, then do yourself a favor and listen to this warm slice of tropical soft rock from the permed prince of melody himself. Eight out of 10. Having just come off the world's first charity benefit gig, the Concert for Bangladesh, which while hugely successful, left Harrison drained from the stresses of making sure the humanitarian aid got to those who actually needed it, instead of to businessmen like Alan Klein, who George was quickly tiring of. Once the live album was eventually released the next year in 1972, George took a solo driving trip across Europe, where at one point, according to the man himself, he chanted the Hare Krishna mantra nonstop for the entire day. This trip reinforced his dedication to Hindu spirituality and set him on a path to make his second solo album and one that lands at the number two spot on this list, the heavily anticipated Living in the Material World. George Harrison was on a roll. Not only had his debut post Beatles album been a hit with critics, it also went to number one around the world. Boldly, Harrison decided to not use any leftover material from that crop of songs, of which there were many, and instead the songs on Material World are from 1971 and 72 only. These compositions go even further in declaring Harrison's spiritual devotion than on his previous effort. Instead of the jubilant chanting of the names of the Lord, on this album, Harrison takes on a more slightly condemning, solemn approach with the song's lyrical content all about eschewing material possessions and temptations, trying to love the Lord more, karma, and the banality of court proceedings. This slightly more cynical mood reflects what was going on for Harrison at the time. Not only was he dealing with the disappointing distribution process for the concert for Bangladesh, his failing marriage to Patty Boyd was also tumbling towards its messy conclusion. Additionally, he was meant to be teaming up with Phil Spector again to produce the album, but had to go it alone due to Spector's erratic and unreliable behavior. On top of all that, he was a man who was desperately trying to rid himself of excess and ego in order to live a more devoted life, but it just so happened to be the same man who released the most successful and acclaimed album of 1970 into 71, and then became a worldwide hero for his humanitarian efforts. George Harrison was nothing if not a man of contradictions, a Pisces fish, and this album explores these contradictions with fascinating depth and honesty. The commitment to his faith also found Harrison in his most disciplined physical peak of his life, having given up smoking for a time, which is evident on this record and showcases the best singing on any George Harrison album, in my opinion. One of the clearest examples of this is on the song The Lord Loves the One Who Loves the Lord. His voice is strong and in control, singing defiantly about the foolish desire of manifesting the Lord through one's own ego. Now the Lord loves 
seeking fame and fortune when it doesn't matter because death will take it all away in the end. It's a big rock number, one of the only pure rock songs on an album heavy with ballads. The use of horns are a window into how George will use them throughout the 70s, and it provides a great taste of his direction into funk and soul. The influence for this track goes to Swami Prabhupada, the founder of the Hare Krishna movement, and the person who taught George that we are not these bodies. An oft-repeated philosophy of Harrison's and one that is explored on the next track. The song Living in the Material World explores George's frustrations at being stuck in this body in the physical world. Musically, the song's rhythm bears a slower similarity to Get Back, and also references the Beatles all by name with the humorous lyrics. Met them all here in the material world. Then throws in one of his best plays on words with, though he started out quite poor, we got. There's also two Indian music middle eights, which are really lovely. Our first slice of completely Indian music since Within You Without You and the Wonderwall soundtrack. It's also a rare occurrence of George Harrison on the sitar. These tranquil moments of Indian music to me symbolize the spiritual sky, the celestial realm that Harrison so desperately longs for. And then we crash back down into the loud rock verses referencing the physical material world. The Beatles continued to get a look in on this album with the only clearly secular song, Sue Me Sue You Blues, about the headache inducing legal battles Harrison experienced in the early 70s. Perhaps the repetitive square dance like Do Si Do versus a reflection of how childish and ever changing George found these endless court proceedings. The Dobro slide guitar sound is similar to that of Lennon's How Do You Sleep, which Harrison also played on. fits appropriately as they're two songs that dredge up the bitterness between ex beatle bandmates, namely Paul McCartney, but also the man he warned them against, Alan Klein. However, most of Harrison's frustrations seem to be aimed at lawyers and courtrooms rather than anyone specific. There's also some great drum fills from Jim Keltner. The only single from the record also happens to be one of its true highlights and the album opener, Give Me Love, Give Me Peace on Earth a natural progression from the vibes of his seismic debut album, the song is yet another fusion of the Western gospel sound and the Hindu bhajan, or devotional song, that Harrison previously employed on tracks like My Sweet Lord and What Is Life. It's incredibly sincere, a prayer flowing straight from Harrison's soul that is both jaunty yet serene, even containing a sustained om in the bridge. Immediately upon hearing the song, it's evident that Harrison's production sound is pared down compared to his previous solo effort, and it allows for a balance that is closer to George Martin's work on Beatle records, with an increased clarity on the acoustic guitars, and more space in general for the other instruments to breathe. The guitar solo in this song has so much personality and spirit, it's easily one of my favourites. <laughs> Give Me Love became Harrison's second US number one after My Sweet Lord. In doing so, the song pushed Paul McCartney and Wings' My Love from the top of the Billboard 100, marking the only time in history where two former Beatles have held the top two chart positions in America. I believe Harrison could have kept his number ones going if he only released this next album highlight, Don't Let Me Wait Too Long, as a single. The track is ridiculously catchy and would have been a surefire hit. The chorus is dreamy and the production showcases everything George Harrison learned from Phil Spector on their last effort, particularly with that big reverb soaked timpani. I especially love George's falsetto on the Why didn't they make this a single? The remaining songs on the album are all slower ballads that go deeper into Harrison's internal conflicts and philosophies. Unlike McCartney who deliberately masked his more personal songs with cryptic imagery or a story of a made up person, Harrison could only write songs about what affected him and couldn't hide or disguise his feelings in his music. You see I'd write what really happened and I couldn't sort of make up something that is untrue because somehow it just doesn't fit in with me. You know, it just, it's like untrue. I can't, I can't even conceive of that. He was completely upfront with his emotions, whether it be his dissatisfaction with the world, his relationship with God, or in this next song's case, the public's need for him to stay the same person they first fell in love with. This is the crux of the song, The Light That Has Lighted the World, which serves as a direct confession from George. Personally, I find this song very moving with some of my favorite Harrison lyrics. It's funny how people just won't accept change. 
got some of my favorite slide guitar work from George, particularly in the closing bars. My favorite description of these six string sobs is from biographer Simon Lang, who wrote, George finally made his guitar gently weep. If you're not sold on this song, listen to the acoustic demo from Early Takes Volume 1. I'm grateful to anyone that is happy. It's a lot more intimate, and without the lavish piano and guitar solo, we're left with George's naked confession of a pop star who just wants to move on. This same sentiment of a man traumatized by his years in the biggest bands in history continues on the next track, Who Can See It? Harrison believes he's paid his dues, he's towed the line, and now just wants to be his own man. This one was a bit of a grower for me. It's another one of those songs that has a slightly meandering, suspended chord progression made up of different time signature changes. But as the song slowly ascends, George's power in those big choruses that close this number are just superb. really channeling Roy Orbison, and despite him not having as strong or as steady a voice as his fellow Wilbury, he really goes for broke and it does make this one of the best vocal performances of Harrison's career. George knew, in the same way as his guitar, how to use his voice to serve the song. This was because, again, George valued the music above all else, and his voice was always used to great effect because of this. This kind of vocal bravado was quite rare in Harrison's discography. George was famously the quiet Beatle, perhaps not quiet, but soft-spoken and gentle, and I think he had a lot of power in that sense. This is perfectly illustrated in perhaps the most powerful of George's quieter, gentler songs, and for me, a real favorite of his compositions, Be Here Now. I was on a plane trip last year in January, a trip that days before I didn't even know that I would be on. It's kind of bizarre. Anyway, I put this album on my headphones and quickly fell asleep because I was exhausted and I woke up to this golden light from the window as the sun was coming up and that moment Be Here Now started and I kind of just sat in a daze watching this beautiful sunrise and heard the song in a way that I'd never heard it before. I'd also started meditating about five months before this and had also read the book be Here Now by Ram Dast that this song was based off. So to hear George sweetly singing in my ear to remember to be here now was just so unexpectedly moving. And now the song makes me cry like pretty much every time I listen to it. It just has a strange enchanting power that takes you to another dimension. The softly picked guitar strings, the flashes of twinkling piano that gently encourage you to exist in the moment. that dreamy sitar drone just makes this song magical. This is a magical song. The pared down beauty of Be Here Now is then suddenly replaced with the enormous wall of sound of the only true Spectre produced track on the album, Try Some Buy Some. A song originally written for Ronnie Spector's proposed comeback album, the same album that was going to feature You from Extra Texture. It's fine, but probably my least favorite track on the album. I just think the sheer amount of Spectre luster somewhat intrudes on the grounded and gentle mood of the record. Like the mandolins and harp, for example, they're just too over the top. <laughs> At the time of this album's release, a key criticism that George Harrison received was from his inferred spiritual elitism, particularly from tracks like The Day the World Gets Round. Written the day after the Bangladesh concert, it reflects the bittersweet feeling of pulling off something so successful that helped a lot of people, but frustration at having to do it in the first place. Why were pop stars responsible for this sort of action and not world leaders who have all the power and resources yet squander it on weapons and other objects that destroy mankind? Personally, I think someone who had shown such altruism had every right to be frustrated that this huge humanitarian effort was being taken apart in the boardroom by people like Alan Klein, no less. Also, as George wrote in I Me Mine, some people have thought that in certain songs like this one, I was giving them a telling off or that I was implying that I was holier than thou. I do not exclude myself and write a lot of things in order to make myself remember. I think that's a key component to remember about Harrison's lyrics. He's preaching to himself more than anyone else. I mentioned earlier about George being the quiet Beatle, and the final song on the album, That Is All, to me is a mature reflection of this status. There's many songs in his career where George will admit to having words fail to explain what he's really trying to express. The problem with talking is, you know, like, the more you say, the more you bury yourself. It's very difficult to express 
what you feel in your heart. In this closer, Harrison sings, Times I find it hard to say with useless words getting in my way. Silence often says much more than trying to say what's been said before. This declaration is the evolution of his 1966 Revolver song, I Want to Tell You. All those words, they seem to slip away as the guitarist continues to struggle with basic language as a way to communicate the scope of his feelings. I've really grown to like this track. I used to see it as rather turgid, but there's just something about those sweet falsetto notes that close out the song that really gets me. That is Again, love George's falsetto. How lyrically appropriate on an album that opens with the words, give me love, closes with, that is all. Give me love, that is all. A pretty wonderful and succinct way to sum up George Harrison. Living in the material world is often not remembered or held in the same esteem as George's magnum opus. But this record is a true forgotten gem that also became his second US Billboard number one. By 1973, much of the Western world was embittered by events like the Vietnam War and the rise of Richard Nixon. And this despondency resulted in many letting go of the idealism of the 60s and instead turned inward, getting high paying jobs and settling down as the me decade of the 1970s was born. But there was still at least one rock and roll star who carried the torch of peace and love and kept it aflame when most others had only material interests in sight. George Harrison, though quick to dismiss the Beatles, fought to preserve their greatest message through his unprecedented charity benefit concert and this revealing, spiritual, and totally sincere album that also happens to contain Harrison's best work as a guitarist and singer. He may never hit quite the same heights after this, but by 1973, there was no denying that George Harrison was an artistic visionary capable of reaching a higher power through music of tremendous depth and breathtaking honesty. Eight and a half out of 10. John Lennon and Paul McCartney were breaking down. John, from the psychological excavation of his own mind through primal scream therapy, and Paul from losing his sacred status as a Beatle, resulting in the former songwriting duo suffering from their own individual identity crises. Both of their debut 1970 albums exhibit this loss in their own way, but while Lennon and McCartney were struggling to come to terms with their standing in the world, George Harrison was ascending. Having been shackled by a measly two song per album quota by his two older bandmates, who also showed little interest at his ever-growing catalogue of impressive original songs. I feel now I can play things, I can learn things that will sound okay. George Harrison was out of their shadow and finally free. The previous four years had seen Harrison go on a journey of personal and spiritual discovery that began with him picking up his first sitar, which led to his lessons and visits to India with Ravi Shankar, who taught George that in Hindu culture, music and religion are intrinsically intertwined, played for the sole purpose of connecting with God, something that forever changed Harrison's approach to music. Not only had he found salvation in Eastern philosophy, but after touring with the Beatles ended, George found that he had time to hang out with musicians that for once didn't disregard his growing talents as a songwriter, but instead nurtured and supported him. People like Bob Dylan, Eric Clapton, Robbie Robertson and the band, Billy Preston, Doris Troy, the last two of which both released albums produced by Harrison, who all in their own way influenced and evolved George's musical foundations, opening him up to sounds like blues, country, gospel, and soul. While all this was happening with George, much of the Western youth was also being turned on to spirituality and polytheism, becoming almost a craze among many young people across the world. And on top of all of this, George had just spent more than 10 years as the musical go-between of the most successful songwriting partnership in history. His Beatle years had given George a musical education unique only to him. So much so that by Abbey Road, his two songs were arguably the best on the whole album. All of this training saw the guitarist poised for a kind of greatness no other musician or artist for that matter had ever found themselves in before. George Harrison was peaking in an unprecedented way. All that was left to do was to make his great artistic statement, or in his words, just get his songs out there. The songs that form my number one all-time favorite George Harrison album, All Things Must Pass. Part of what makes All Things Must Pass such a fascinating album is that it was born out of Harrison's desire to separate himself from his Beatles history. I mean, you only have to look at the album artwork to see that. But the irony here is that the themes of All Things Must Pass, spiritual salvation, relationship breakdowns, humanity, fame, life, death, and friendship, all stem from his experience as a Beatle. He was trying to escape from something he was still intrinsically wound up in. For an album that needed to appeal to God, 
Harrison acquired the liturgical wall of sound that only legendary producer Phil Spector could provide. Even though the two co-producers couldn't have been more different in temperament, stylistically they created music of the divine. And I needed somebody to help me suddenly to be a solo artist with no producer, you know, and no group. You know, yeah. so it's like, you know, it's quite a big jump. I went to George's uh, Friar Park, which he had just purchased, and he said, I have a few, a few ditties for you to hear. It was endless. He had literally hundreds of songs, and each one was better than the rest. He had all this emotion built up when it released to me. And to help him bring out this cathedral-like sound was a stellar lineup of musicians, including Eric Clapton taking a good chunk of lead guitar duties, Klaus Vorman on bass, Ringo Starr and Alan White on drums, members of Delaney and Bonnie and Derek and the Dominoes, as well as several others. But how does one open an album that contains a smorgasbord of musical categories, including hard rock, gospel, Krishna chanting, pop, southern blues rock, country, and folk? Something this majestic needs to go big out of the gate, right? Ultimately, Harrison decided to take a leaf out of the band's book by opening with the gentle and understated I'd Have You Anytime. From the very first line, Let me in here. I know I've been here. Harrison is softly pleading with his audience to let him in. Let his songs into the lives of millions of people who were at a loss after the Beatles' breakup and needed the balm of George Harrison's music. The lyrics are rooted in the union of Harrison and Bob Dylan as they co-wrote this track when George was staying with the folk singer in December 1968. After an apparently uncomfortable first couple of days, they finally got their guitars out and George came up with the opening lyrics as a way to literally communicate with Dylan, who found the words for the chorus while Harrison wrote the verses. The chord progression came from Dylan who wanted to see the complex major seventh, diminished and augmented chords that Harrison was known for. The end result is a mellow and sweet number that reflects a mature vulnerability from Harrison and Dylan. A wonderful choice to ease you into what will be a very rewarding listening experience. This understated opening soon makes way for one of George Harrison's most legendary songs as powerful six string strumming and glistening zithers transports you up to heaven where George Harrison is there to debut what would soon become his trademark sound, the slide guitar. <laughs> George's slide guitar vignettes are pivotal to the man forming his own identity. He didn't have the blues roots background that allowed players like Clapton and Hendrix to perform face-melting multi-minute solos. Because of this lack of virtuosic ability, Harrison was, up to this point, quite self-conscious as a guitar player. Really? Just Eric, because he's very good at that. You know, at, like improvising and keeping it going, which I'm not good at. Certainly not helped by Paul McCartney's occasional micromanaging on George's guitar solos, or even just insisting that McCartney do them himself. But Harrison's slide guitar technique allowed him to generate the inflections of Indian instruments like the sarangi through the micro vibrations of the bottleneck slide. <laughs> Using a rock instrument to create sounds inspired by Indian music is the perfect complement to My Sweet Lord. As previously mentioned, classical Indian music exists as a conduit to God. And here, Harrison was combining the impassioned call and response vocals of gospel music via the framework of classic rock. Featuring the messages of Christian and Krishna faiths as the chanting flits between Hallelujah and Hare Krishna, George was showing us that it's not important what religious organization you're part of, Forming a relationship with God is all that matters. And anyone, regardless of their faith, can create that cosmic connection by chanting the phrase, My Sweet Lord. The song itself was inspired by the Edwin Hawkins singer's rendition of the 18th century Christian hymn, Oh Happy Day. Oh happy day, oh happy day, oh happy day. My Sweet Lord is impeccably constructed right down to the backing vocals, all done by Harrison. Sweet Lord. Or as is credited in the album, the George O'Hara Smith Singers. There's something gloriously uplifting about this song, like a chemical change occurs in the body when you listen to it. I feel like even if you've heard it many times before, at one point you'll listen to My Sweet Lord and think it's the greatest song of all time. That's the power it has. George received letters from former addicts his whole life thanking him for creating this song that saved them. It became the biggest selling single of 1971 in the UK and the first US number one for any ex-Beatle. 
And yes, it was of course slightly tainted by the copyright claim that it stole elements of He's So Fine by the Chiffons. He's so fine. It was a heavily litigated battle that went on for years with the verdict that Harrison subconsciously plagiarised some melodic elements. It's almost laughable today how after 70 years of pop music how similar so many number one songs are. Because not to sound like a boomer, but you can switch on the radio right now and there will be a song playing that sounds at least like a dozen others. But even without the copyright controversy, My Sweet Lord is a soaring, majestic anthem, an epic prayer and an immaculate slice of 70s pop. And remember, George Harrison took a risk making this his debut single as a solo artist, but after years in the shadows, the quiet Beatle was finally being heard. Remember in Get Back there was that quietly devastating scene where George temporarily quit the Beatles? Uh, I think I'll be le uh, leaving what? the band now. When? Now. Yeah, well that same night he put all of his frustrations at not being listened to, not being taken seriously, into one of the early 70s best hard rock songs, Wah Wah. <laughs> That opening riff is one of Harrison's greatest guitar licks. It's as vicious and biting as the lyrics of Harrison singing, you don't see me crying, you don't hear me sighing, which now always makes me think of Paul McCartney. The rhythm of this song is also just insanely good, from the maracas, congas and tambourine, to Starr's drums and Vorman's bass locking into each other, perfectly channeling George's frustrations and anger. Harrison's voice is glorious and severe, even in this uncharacteristically higher register. Though it is drowned out a bit by Spectre's Everything Everywhere All At Once approach to the production. Eric Clapton's guitar is appropriately fed through a wah-wah pedal, and the frantic guitar solo in this song is like the brimming staccato sound of George's exasperation finally set free. <laughs> Although Wawa exhibits some bitterness towards George's former bandmates, the song is more a liberating celebration of his newfound solo identity. This is reinforced in 1971 when Wawa became the first song George Harrison played live as a solo artist at the concert for Bangladesh. If a five and a half minute wall of sound rock number wasn't enough to convince you that this is an album of epic proportions, then the next song should leave no doubt in your mind. A piano and acoustic guitar gently open on a G chord as the seven minute grandiose Isn't It A Pity begins. The B-side to My Sweet Lord, this Harris song that dates back to 1966, in fact it was reportedly first offered up on Revolver, is George's lament for humanity on a grand scale. Isn't it a pity? This version, like many songs on the album, was arranged by Harrison's friend John Barham, whom Harrison met back in 1966 as both men were students of Ravi Shankar. Despite it being an older composition, its lyrical content cohesively aligns with the themes of friendships breaking down and spiritual ties that bond humankind that is heard all over All Things Must Pass. The slow build from guitar and piano to the awakening strings and rising horns creates a reverent and beautiful atmosphere. It's George's very own Hey Jude, even reprising the na 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 na's from the McCartney song, but this time, George gets to keep his terrific guitar solos. Those slide guitar vignettes are the moments of flickering hope as they weave through the more pensive orchestra. The bittersweet mood, the swelling atmosphere, and the superb orchestral arrangement showcases the last vestiges of the Beatles in this magisterial, all-time great song from Harrison. So great, it's on the album twice, with version 2 a shorter reprise sans orchestra, but with the addition of more electric guitar from Clapton. So we've just heard three achingly emotional songs. Spiritual exaltation on My Sweet Lord, anger and frustration on Wah Wah, and sumptuous melancholy tinged with hope on Isn't It A Pity. An absolutely insane run of songs that just keeps going as we arrive at pop soul euphoria on the up-tempo What Is Life. This track proves that George isn't just capable of sweeping hymns and intimate ballads, but that he can still write a jubilant pop song that's as catchy as any Beatles hit single. I feel like this is the song that every feel-good rom-com or family movie uses in their trailer. See also This Will Be by Natalie Cole. Oh, I mean, 
what's not to love about this track? The gorgeous George harmonies to that guitar lick that gets right in your body. It's an absolute stunner. We finally bring things down again on the folky, if not for you. This is actually a Bob Dylan song and it honestly feels like George is channeling him here. So sweet, no, not, not in that way. They'd obviously spent a lot of time together and it appeared that there was an intuitive understanding between the two soft-spoken musicians. John Lennon had always been the one that fascinated Bob Dylan, but George Harrison had been Dylan's lifelong friend and equal. A wonderful bit of earnest folk pop that Harrison made his own by highlighting the delightful melody and bringing to life the romantic imagery with his slide guitar. If not for you, this is the point where folk transforms into full country on Behind That Locked Door. That pedal steel from Pete Drake is just divine. Harrison later praised Drake's pedal steel playing as the quote, bagpipes of country and western music. This song also contains some of my favourite lyrics from All Things Must Pass. It's so open, so vulnerable. On the opening number, I'd Have You Any Time, George was trying to get Dylan to let his guard down. But on Behind That Locked Door, he's asking Dylan to fully open up. So let out your heart, please. These two songs of reassurance and support offer a special and beautiful connection between George Harrison and Bob Dylan. He was very unabashed and uh, uh, romantic about it in, in a sense. You know, I found that he was very, uh, he had these love relationships with his friends. He loved them. After this little break from the bombast of Phil Spector's overwhelming production, we return with full force on the explosive yet serene Let It Down. <laughs> This is possibly the most wall of sound track on the whole album. A song filled with lust and desire, it's also the horniest song on All Things Must Pass. I mean, I see your eyes are busy kissing mine, let your hair hang all around me, let your love flow and astound me. The weekend ain't got nothing on these lyrics. Even though George was on an ongoing spiritual journey where desires of the ego and the heart were intrusions to the ascetic path he was on, the lustful urges that are packaged with being the biggest pop star on the planet soon caught up with him. His marriage to Patty Boyd was slowly breaking down and these type of affairs with other women were becoming more and more common. Let It Down is a superb track. The dramatic shift between the loud chorus and soft verses is an approach many indie bands would incorporate in their own music decades later. If Wawa was the explosive response to months of pent up vexation at being sidelined by John and Paul, then Run of the Mill is the clear headed and sincere statement from the heart to his two former bandmates. It's heartbreaking and poetic. Even George admitted that the song's lyrics read like a poem. On the surface, it's a song of disappointment and hurt, but listening a little deeper, it's George expressing his love towards his old band. Listening to this karmic song can itself be a cathartic or shattering experience. And like on the cinematic Wawa, wow wow, the context of Get Back gives Run of the Mill so much more depth, having seen firsthand their relationship and how the four Beatles were becoming fundamentally incompatible beings. Even the title of the song can be seen as a possible description by McCartney or Lennon of Harrison's musical contributions. It's a beautiful and mature song that also happens to be one of Olivia Harrison's favourite tunes from a late husband. The reflective mood continues on the next track, Beware of Darkness. Musically, this song moves in a fascinating and winding direction with some of Harrison's most complex chord progressions on the whole album. This serpentine melody is without a doubt the result of George's increasing understanding of Indian harmonic sensibilities. I feel like a lot of his work on extra texture is going for similarly complex chord progressions, but they just don't work as successfully as on Beware of Darkness. The music and lyrics have a foreboding quality to them and present a similar warning as on Within You Without You of remaining cautious of the illusion or Maya in its many forms. Beware of Maya from thoughts that linger to the corrupt intent of greedy leaders. And he's on the money. The lyrics are as poignant today as they were in 1970. In fact, at the Republican National Convention in 2016, when Ivanka Trump introduced her father on stage to Here Comes the Sun, George Harrison's estate blasted the unauthorized use of the song and tweeted, if it had been beware of darkness, then we may have approved it. Before things get too dark and solemn, we hear a jangly guitar and harmonica zoom into the picture as Apple Scruffs begins. 
Bob Dylan's influence on All Things Must Pass continues with this delightful number which is played in the style of early Dylan with an acoustic guitar and harmonica leading the song. This is a charming ditty written for the dedicated fans of the Beatles before and after their breakup that hung around EMI Studios and Apple offices who just wanted to see the musicians they loved so much. Why? Just wanna see him, that's why. Before hearing this song, if you would ask me who is the Beatle most likely to write a tribute song to these girls, I wouldn't have guessed Moody George. But that's the thing about this man, right when you think you've got him figured out, he goes and creates something like the wonderful Apple Scruffs. It's another of George's many contradictions. He was someone who was very wary of fan worship, and yet these girls meant a great deal to him. He would often ask after their families and even invited the Scruffs in to hear this recording after he'd completed it, which they returned in kind with a giant wreath of flowers. And although it's undoubtedly inspired by early Dylan, I also think that because of the playful falsetto harmonies in the chorus, Apple Scruffs is also a nod to the girl group stylings that attracted these fans in the first place. Seriously, this is some of George's best backup singing on any of his albums. Apple Scruffs, Apple Scruffs. Wendy Sutcliffe, a real life Apple Scruff, said of Harrison's tribute, it was like he had seen it all, understood how he felt, and most of all, knew that we weren't just sad, stupid girlies. I just wish George only knew how young fans 50 years later still resonate with this delightful song that even outdoes Paul McCartney's charm and whimsy. I had to make a coffee because I am getting exhausted. You know, this video was 40 pages. 40 pages, 28,000 words, just a bit over that, if you're wondering. <laughs> this album has covered a lot of ground, but now it's time to cover the literal ground of George's eccentric neo-gothic mansion, Friar Park, as we take a tour with the song, The Ballad of Sir Frankie Crisp, Let It Roll, a whimsical and mysterious tune that serves as a tribute to the original owner of Friar Park and fellow gardener, Sir Frank Crisp. The reverb soaked song can be likened to a cinematic journey through the grand house and grounds of the estate as we Let it roll across the floor. through the hall and out the door. We've heard lyrics from other songs that's come from wall engravings around Friar Park, but now we finally get a proper musical tour of the estate, one that perfectly fits the album artwork. A humorous yet gothic delight. After a lot of deep thoughts and rumination, we land back into pop ecstasy with another album highlight, Awaiting On You All. <laughs> Man, this song is just euphoric jubilation and simply impossible to resist. It's another track where Harrison espouses his syncretistic view of faith as he sings It reinforces George's view that it's not religion he's espousing but a direct relationship with God. The lyrics have a really nice flow to them, they're a lot of fun, I mean he rhymes visas with Jesus and it's just excellent but it also contains a verse that EMI and Capitol Records continue to omit from the album's lyrics that highlight the materialism of the Catholic Church. It's helplessly catchy and perfectly highlights Phil Spector's monstrous wall of sound technique to great effect. Probably the best use of it on the entire LP. Those harmonized slide guitars that glide back and forth throughout that create a frolicking and playful energy while the memorable bass line and infectious rhythm will have even the most staunch non-believer chanting the names of the Lord for all of its tight two minutes and 48 seconds. After the rapturous fun of Awaiting On You All, we finally arrive at the title track, All Things Must Pass. I can't believe that John and Paul overlooked this song. I honestly think they were scared of how good it is, how it perfectly closes this chapter of their lives. What a beautiful conclusion it could have been to their final album together. A mature and sincere meditation on life and death. Music is a definite homage to Robbie Robertson and the band. While the lyrics are based on a Timothy Leary poem, which itself is a psychedelic adaptation of the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. On top of this song acting as a statement on the end of the Beatles, All Things Must Pass carries with it an even heavier weight when acknowledging the death of Harrison's devoted mother Louise after a lengthy period of illness. Following on from the title track is then probably the weakest song on the album, I Dig Love. A playful and listenable enough song, but when compared to the rest of the gold on the album, it certainly stands out as the first to go if you were ever to pare down the number of tracks. But hey, the lyrical content is hard to argue with, a jaunty ditty dedicated to free love. But then we get the insanely infectious and rollicking art of dying. Man, this song goes so hard. Another early composition from 1966. Its up-tempo rhythm shows almost a hint of early disco, but with an eerie foreboding atmosphere. The 
lyrics, however, examine the incredibly complex subject of the moment your soul leaves your body and reincarnation. It's another example of George Harrison's maturity that a man in his mid-twenties had such a deep understanding of the Hindu concept of reincarnation that he could turn it into a blistering rock song that also defied the superficiality of the very music business he was in. And I know I've ragged on the guy in the past, but Eric Clapton's guitar solo here is... Woof. Now before I finish with the final song on what many consider to be the core album, I'll briefly discuss the set of instrumental rock tracks known as Apple Jam. All Things Must Pass is considered rock's very first triple album by a single act. And on sides five and six of this LP, George Harrison and co showcase why, with their stellar talents as a jam band. These tracks consist of Out of the Blue, an 11 minute blues banger that features Klaus Vorman ripping it up on the guitar in the style of Clapton. Plug Me In, a rollicking track that sees Harrison, Clapton and Dave Mason trading guitar solos a la The End, with Jerry Lee Lewis inspired piano from Bobby Whitlock. I Remember Jeep opens with strange Moog synthesizer effects before a bluesy hand clapping rock instrumental plays out for eight minutes. Thanks for the Pepperoni sees the guitarist trade more solos between them over a Chuck Berry styled rocker. And finally we have the absurd It's Johnny's Birthday. It's Johnny's Birthday! It's Johnny's Birthday! A twisted and demented carnival nightmare with plenty of Harrison humor. The 49 second track was created for John Lennon's 30th birthday after Yoko Ono requested a gift from Harrison. Sung to the tune of Cliff Richard's Congratulations, it's one of the kookiest recordings of Harrison's career. As I previously mentioned, many don't consider Apple Jam to be officially part of the core album of songs as they were only included to justify the high price of the triple LP. But personally, I'm glad they were added on. Usually when I listen to the album, I'll typically stop after side four, but at the same time, the jams exist as a rollickingly fun victory lap like the credits of a movie you're not quite ready to leave after it's over and I don't know, I think that's pretty cool. But the final track on the core All Things Must Pass is Harrison's sweeping hymn for salvation. Hear Me Lord, a song about a relationship with God but without the catchy upbeat quality of previous tracks on this album. Instead, it exhibits a naked, desperate longing. To me, this song has parallels with John Lennon. Both Lennon and Harrison's 1970 album Closes were about a higher power, but where Lennon declares that God is a concept by which we measure our pain, Harrison is asking from the depths of his soul as Lennon did in 1965 for help. Help to love with more feeling, to rise a little higher. This is a man at an inflection point, about to leave everything he knew behind and venture into the mysterious unknown. It's emotional and incredibly riveting. A superb operatic finale. What George Harrison achieved on All Things Must Pass was nothing short of miraculous. Especially when you consider that he played the role of songwriter, singer, guitarist, and co-producer all at the tender age of 27. But that all of these songs are great, many of them genuinely excellent, is the true miracle. You could pick any three tracks off this album and call them the best and it would be hard to argue with you. The sheer amount of genres covered in the final product shows just how versatile Harrison's talents were not only as a musician but as a lover of music. Here he opened us up to the full dimensions of his spirituality and invited us to love in a new way, to the extent that listening to this album is a holy and cosmic experience. Even before I started, I knew I was going to make a good album because I had so many songs and I had so much energy. For me to do my own album after all that, it was joyous. Dream of dreams. It's not only George Harrison's best solo album, but the best solo album of any of the four Beatles. I'm sorry, Ram, you hold a dear place in my heart, but there's just no topping this. I have no hesitation calling it a masterpiece. It was the album that proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that although Lennon and McCartney's songwriting steered the Beatles ship to success in the early days, by the band's end, it was clear that George Harrison was as gifted a musical genius as either John or Paul. And perhaps, he was even better. 10 out of 10. So that's my ranking of George Harrison's post Beatles studio albums. A spiritual odyssey that paints a spectacular portrait of one man's quest for love and truth. But before I sum up the seismic impact of George Harrison's music, we've got a few more albums that shed even more light on his immeasurable influence on the world. To begin with, we're going all the way back to 1968 to the earliest solo Beatle album, and the first on their new Apple Records label. I am of course talking about Wonderwall music. 
While working on the Beatles' Magical Mystery Tour, George Harrison was approached by far-out American director Joe Massett, who asked George if he'd like to compose the soundtrack to Massett's new film, Wonderwall. George wasn't certain of his abilities as he'd never done anything like this before, but Massett insisted he'd have full creative control. Harrison was intrigued by the plot, a stuffy, introverted scientist who discovers a secret hole in the wall to his neighbor's apartment, a hot young swinging 60s couple who are into psychedelia and making love. The scientist soon grows into an obsessed peeping Tom, becoming infatuated with the object, or Penny Lane as she's called, and eventually saves her life at the end of the film. Yeah, the plot's kind of rubbish, but its attempts to explore isolation and the dangers of fame and celebrity obsession were themes that rather appealed to George Harrison. As George's interest in Indian music was at a peak in the late 60s, he decided he would approach the assignment as an opportunity to spread the word and hook people into the beauty of non-Western music. He'd already demonstrated this with the Beatles songs Love You Too and Within You Without You, but this would give him an opportunity to fully explore the musical anthology of Indian music for Western ears. He traveled to Mumbai to work with some of the finest Indian musicians, some working with him again on the Dark Horse tour in 1974. George's method of scoring was to watch the film with a couple of stopwatches to time out the passages of music he would compose. He also enlisted the help of his friend and fellow Shankar pupil, John Barham, to translate, arrange, and organize Harrison's various musical ideas. From the mysterious microbes to the pure psychedelia of dream scene, Even the honky-tonk silliness of drilling a home shows an impressive musical dexterity from the young guitarist. His most stunning track is Love Scene, an enchanting number that utilizes double-tracked sarods, something that had never been done before in Indian music. Wonderwall music is a curious mix of mostly Indian music and some Western rock that scores a film from the dying days of the 60s belief that young artists could enlighten the world. In that regard, the film is very much of its time, but the score remains a fascinating introduction to the genesis of world music, something George Harrison was at the forefront of pioneering. George lent the other odd song or two to film soundtracks in the 80s, but never did anything else quite on the scale of Wonderwall music. A few songs from the handmade film Shanghai Surprise ended up on Cloud Nine, but the other couple from the movie aren't really worth mentioning. Instead, it's time to discuss George Harrison's first instrumental album that wasn't made for a film, an album that wasn't really made for anyone with ears for that matter, the 1969 experimental Electronic Sound. While in Los Angeles in 1968, producing Jackie Lomax's album, George Harrison was introduced to the Moog 3 synthesizer by Bernie Krauss, the sales representative for the electronic instrument on the West Coast. This was during a period where Harrison had abandoned the guitar to learn the sitar, which subsequently led him to composing more tunes on keyboards such as Blue Jay Way from Magical Mystery Tour. One of the two lengthy recordings from Electronic Sound, No Time or Space, comprises an edit of a Moog demonstration given by Krauss, which Harrison allegedly used for the album Album without his knowledge, upsetting Krauss's ambition to introduce the Moog sound to the world on his own record. The other track, Under the Mersey Wall, was recorded by Harrison on his own Moog in Britain. One of the main issues was that the synth carried no instruction manual, meaning that Harrison barely knew how to operate it. The result is an album consisting of blips and blops, whistles and fizzes, and more disorientating zaps and zorps, as if someone recorded R2-D2 malfunctioning over the course of 43 minutes. Like John and Yoko's three albums of the late 60s, it was released on Apple's avant-garde subsidiary label, Zapple. But unlike John and Yoko, George had the good sense to stop at one release. The best I can say about it is that it contributed to the genesis of instruments in popular music, showcased by the fact that George Harrison introduced the move to the Beatles' sonic palette where it features on Abbey Road. But otherwise, it's just noise, man. George Harrison, despite his aversion to the Beatles during his solo career, was not someone who craved singular attention or individual pop fame. What he really loved was to be part of a band, whether it be the pre-fame Beatle years or his 1974 Dark Horse tour band, or even the Monty Python guys. Being able to melt into the background was his preferred status in a group. And after the release of Cloud Nine, he was presented with an opportunity to join one last band. The group came together by chance. Basically, George Harrison and Jeff Lynne were in LA where Roy Orbison offered to sing on a track they were working on. To save money, the three of them utilized Bob Dylan's home studio to record it, but George left his guitar at Tom Petty's house who came to deliver it and thus the traveling Wilburys were born. The thing happened completely 
just by magic, just by circumstances. Maybe there was a full moon that night or something like that. The band began recording before they even considered a full album. Their first single was a Harris song that was completed with the group after they spotted a label on a box in Bob Dylan's garage that said, Handle With Care. A wonderful track with a charming chord progression that showcases the group's distinct vocal abilities. From the grisly Dylan to Everybody's got somebody. to the angelic vibrato of Orbison. Won't you show me that you really care? And with Dylan's trademark harmonica and Harrison's sly guitar, the track was destined to become a classic. The whole band gave various contributions to all tracks on their first album, Travelling Wilburys Volume 1, although each song was written mainly by a single member. Harrison's key track was Heading for the Light, an upbeat rocker that reflects George rediscovering his spiritual purpose with some great backing vocals and powerful saxophone. Harrison also contributed heavily to the irresistibly catchy End of the Line. This is the most Beatles-esque track on the whole album and showcases the vocal talents of everyone save for Dylan. You've also got longtime drama of Harrison's Jim Keltner striking a great beat on the skins. Well, it's all right. Right around. Man, Jim Keltner, he really seems like he's just one of the most humble guys in rock and roll. This is another one of those songs you've heard a million times in movie trailers, most likely due to its feel-good affability. Like, I think there's literally a Tom Hanks movie out right now that used it. Well, it's all right. How did you get in here? Elsewhere, there's good old-fashioned skiffle on Rattled. Last Night contains a sunny mood reflecting on an amusing evening. Roy Orbison's vocals at the end of Not Alone. You've even got a classic Dylan folktale on Tweeter and the Monkey Man. Obviously, this didn't happen to everyone, but you know when you're a kid and your dad and his buddies got together to play guitar music to the songs of their youth? Well, that's what's going on here, except it's these guys. What's so magical about this album is that you really get a sense of the fun they're having. There was no time to add any production gloss, so it feels raw and carefree, but that's 100% the appeal. This isn't an album you listen to for innovation, but to feel the infectious spontaneity of it all. Fueled by beer and coffee, these fellas created some of the most rambunctious and delightful tunes of their careers. It's energetic, tongue-in-cheek, and sounds absolutely wonderful. Yeah, Traveling Wilburys Volume 1 rips, man. I love this record. Comparing it to George's solo work doesn't really count because it's a true group effort, but I think it's better than Cloud9. It's the Cloud9 fans. After the success of Volume 1, Roy Orbison tragically died of a heart attack. Despite this truly unfortunate event, the remaining Wilburys decided to make a second album. I mean, we love Roy. Um, life flows on within you and without you, and he's around, you know, in his astral body. With Harrison coming up with the amusing idea of calling it Travelling Wilburys Volume 3. While not quite as good as Volume 1, Volume 3 sticks with the Blues Roots formula to create more charming rock and skiffle tracks. However, the absence of Roy Orbison's voice and personality is a significant loss, and the breezy and cheerful vibe of the first LP isn't felt quite as strongly. Perhaps to fill the huge void of Orbison, George Harrison's guitar work is more prominent on this album. He even creates a twin sitar and slide guitar solo on The Devil's Been Busy. <laughs> The song Seven Deadly Sins has some beguiling doo-wop harmonies. Seven, seven, seven deadly sins. The Spanish rhythm of New Blue Moon has a great feel to it that reminds me of Paul McCartney's song Hope of Deliverance from Off the Ground. Plus it features Bob Dylan scatting these lethargic yahoos that always make me chuckle. You, you, yeah, you. Travelling Wilburys Volume 3 is a fun romp, but ultimately demonstrated that the magic born out of musical spontaneity can only last for so long and was the final Wilburys album. The Travelling Wilburys created some real late career frivolity for a bunch of aging rock and rollers, pondering their existence in the modern music world. When people bring up the term supergroup, they are always the first band that I think of. And through amusing pseudonyms, members like Harrison and Dylan could hide from their own superstardom and get back to their initial love making carefree music with their mates. 
As far as George Harrison compilations go, there are some to avoid and some that are essential. Basically any of those studio cash grabbing compilations from before the year 2000 are not worth it. I can recommend Let It Roll, the songs from George Harrison from 2009, which does a fairly decent job of spanning his entire solo career. But by far the best one, and it's not really even a compilation, but I have brought it up previously in this video, is Early Takes Volume 1 from 2011, which was released alongside Martin Scorsese's three hour documentary on George Harrison, Living in the Material World. These are mostly acoustic demos or early takes of some of Harrison's best songs. They maintain this naked vulnerability and raw beauty that always leaves me in awe every time I listen to this album. And to George Harrison's estate, we're still waiting on volume two. It's now been 12 years. And finally, to George Harrison's live albums. If you want to hear the hits of his solo career and the Beatles, I would recommend Live in Japan from 1992. Opening with I Want to Tell You and continuing with cuts like Taxman, If I Needed Someone and Piggies, here is where you can finally listen to George Harrison play songs live from his non-touring Beatle years that people had been waiting nearly three decades for. Joined by Eric Clapton, he also plays a fairly safe list of solo tracks, including a full-voiced Dark Horse, but the rest are essentially All Things Must Pass or Cloud Nine cuts. This is a highly polished and inviting live album that picks up energy as it moves along, culminating in a powerful and nostalgic encore. Plus, I really dig the album artwork. Rewind 20 years to George Harrison's previous and only other live tour from 1974, which unfortunately has never seen an official release. The Dark Horse tour was obviously marred by Harrison's hoarse vocals, but the parts of it that I have seen and heard from bootlegs are absolutely riveting. Playing with a band that specialised in funk and R&B, plus a host of Indian musicians, this tour made for some truly wild and eclectic offerings that I would kill to see and hear in an official capacity, laryngitis be damned. I'll quickly add that one year on from his death, the concert for George was made to honour and commemorate the late artist. Several of George's friends, including some Wilburys, Python Pals, and of course Paul and Ringo, celebrate the man by playing a blockbuster setlist of songs from his Beatle years, All Things Must Pass, and the single Give Me Love. But otherwise, the only other song featured out of his entire solo career is randomly an album track from Gone Troppo, That's The Way It Goes. That's the way it goes. The highlight to me will always be McCartney's tribute and ukulele version of Something. Something in the way she moves. Which he still performs in concerts to this day. But if you want the ultimate live George Harrison album, you need look no further than the groundbreaking world first concert for Bangladesh. The splitting of Bangladesh, or what was formerly known as Eastern Pakistan, from the rest of the Pakistani state resulted in millions of displaced Bengali refugees. Ravi Shankar, overcome by the devastation of his homeland, turned to his friend George for help. Mr. Harrison, with all of the enormous problems in the world, how did you happen to choose this one to do something about? Because I was asked by a friend if I'd help, you know, that's all. Harrison, despite his aversion to playing live, sought out the biggest venue possible, Madison Square Garden, and enlisted all the help he could get from his musical friends. This resulted in a band spanning Indian classical, folk, blues, gospel soul, southern rock, and British pop rock, who all together generated a real-life wall of sound, especially with the double drumming impact of Keltner and Starr. Highlights of the set include the mesmerizing Bangladan from the likes of Ravi Shankar and Ali Akbar Khan, George's live debut as a solo artist with the explosive Wah Wah, a truly stirring rendition of Beware of Darkness and Here Comes the Sun, Bob Dylan's mini set of five songs is a total revelation, especially considering the touch and go nature of him appearing at all. It's hard to pick a favorite of his, but Blowing in the Wind and the three-way voices of Harrison, Russell, and Dylan on Just Like a Woman are two standout moments. Just like a woman. I mean, it's all jaw-dropping stuff. You also get one of Harrison's most powerful vocal performances on the song written for the benefit, the rousing Bangladesh, driven not by a desire to be an enigmatic frontman, but a faithful conviction to help his friend and hopefully save some lives. Harrison's emotional resonance on this finale is positively riveting. But my absolute highlight is Billy Preston stealing the show just like he did in Get Back with an electrifying performance of That's The Way God Planned It, where he was so energized by the song that he got up on stage and, well, in his words, The band was jamming and it was pumping, the people were with us and, you know, you know just had to rejoice. The concert for Bangladesh 
was legendary. Not only did it reunite two Beatles on stage for the first time since 1966, it also featured Bob Dylan's first live performance in five years. But most importantly, it was the world's first multi-artist charity benefit gig and set a towering example of what such an event can achieve. With the proceeds exceeding 240,000 US dollars, this concert formed the template for future rock benefits such as Live Aid. You actually can't stream this album. I bought it on iTunes and I believe it's because the sales of the album continued to benefit George Harrison's UNICEF fund. The concert was just one example of how George Harrison literally changed the world with his kindness and his music. If you watch the Concept for Bangladesh video on the Beatles YouTube channel, the top comment is from a Bangladeshi man who says, During our liberation war in 1971, that money from that concert helped us a lot. And now the name George Harrison and his great work for our liberation is written in the textbooks of every children in our country. I am a 12th class student and I am giving entrance exams for different universities and I literally have to know the details of this concert to appear in the tests. Thank you, George Harrison. Stepping out from the shadow of the Beatles was always going to be a daunting task for George Harrison, someone who had no ambition or ego to eclipse his former bandmates, but through sheer musical genius, still did. Harrison would never consider himself a genius though. A man who practiced shedding his ego over the course of his life was hardly going to be a great cheerleader of his own work, but George Harrison's music is truly in a league of its own. When we talk about innovation, sure, Lennon and McCartney created endless bursts of new ideas and sonic textures, but by introducing Indian music into Western rock, George Harrison shifted the pop music world on its axis. This union of musical styles allowed for glorious new sounds, textures, time signatures, and chord progressions that were pivotal to the history of world music. But for Harrison, it was the spiritual aspiration of Indian music to form a connection, a relationship with God that began a lifelong path of devotion. Where other artists of the 60s and 70s bought into fads but quickly moved on to whichever caught their eye next, George Harrison never gave up on his spiritual journey and quest for love and truth in music. This corresponds to Harrison's approach as a musician to service the song above all else. Even back in his Beatle days, George wasn't a flashy guitarist interested in wild solos and flamboyant antics. His contributions were in the intricate details and moving arrangements. This approach led to his ultimate musical expression through the slide guitar, which allowed him to access the myriad of tones and cadences of Indian ragas, conveying his spiritual vision more than words ever could. And when he did sing, his power came not from innate technical ability, but from unyielding conviction and stunning emotional expression. At its center, George Harrison's musical cornerstone was his gift for melody, allowing for a timelessness in his songs that will hold up long after production trickery and sonic trends fall out of fashion. I'm not sure George Harrison ever really knew how beloved he was, but I know for sure that he was a deep and truly special person. Not many people come along like George Harrison. His humility, kindness, sense of humor, and his divine musical expression was a gift to the world. Hare Krishna, George. We miss you. They say I'm not what I used to be All the same I'm happier than a willow tree Shine on Sitting here by a stream mm, That mystical one I knew Is returned Lulling me with those rain cloud eyes Taking me and melting my heart away Taking me and melting my heart away Well, that was a huge effort. But hey, that's finally it for the Beatles solo album rankings. <laughs> ne- what was that? Peace huh? and love. The fans will dig it. No. Ringo. No. No, I can't be. They've waited long enough. No. No. <laughs> no! <laughs> no! <laughs>